Welcome in, everyone. Hey, everybody. This is Everything Sucks, Let's Fix It, episode 10. That's a big deal. <laughs> it is. That's double digits. Double digits. That's huge. Two whole hands. <laughs> big milestone for us. That's wild. Yeah, the next the next episode, we won't be able to count on our fingers. So That's so depressing. We have to bring toes into the game. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah, my name is Ben Mayer. My name is Anthony Buono. Today is July 24th, 2023. And as always, we have a lot to talk about. A lot. We're going to start off with our current events. This current events section is going to be a little more focused on the political game rather than the political policy. Yeah. I love the game. I'm addicted to the game. <laughs> yeah. I never stop following the game. So, You really are our political game theorist. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like that. I'm the political game theorist. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get right into it. We're going to start off with uh, a Wisconsin special election for the Assembly District in... Uh, District 26. Mm. This is outside of uh, Milwaukee, one of the Milwaukee suburbs. This is hardcore conservative base territory. Um, the general calculus of Wisconsin, and we'll talk about this more in a bit, but the general calculus of, of a Republican in Wisconsin is the Democrats are going to run it up in Milwaukee City, they're going to run it up in Dane County, and then you're going to win in the suburbs and everywhere else, and you're going to be able to outcompete them. Well, so this is a part of that Republican firewall of the state that makes it possible for them to win statewide. So we had Paul Melitic as the GOP nominee running against Bob Tatterson. This is Bob Tatterson's second run at this seat. And the Republican won 53 to 46. So Republican won by around seven points there. Mm -hmm. Initially, you think that's like a pretty good sign. You would think, okay, the Republicans kept district. That's theirs. The Democrats didn't flip it. Republicans are in for a good year. Well, it gets a little deeper. When you dig a little deeper, you notice some problems. In 2020, the Republican won this seat by 22 or 23 points. Wow. And now the Republicans only win it by seven. So that's a, what is that? It's a 16, 15 point, something like that. It's mm. point swing towards the Democratic Party. Yeah. That's a big deal. And what that, especially coming out of the Wisconsin suburbs, and that's meaning that the Republicans aren't, they're, they're, they're too extreme for the suburbs now. And this is part of a longer shift of the Democrats chipping away at the Republican suburbs for a long time, hmm. which really came to a head in 2018. But what we were learning is they haven't maxed out their suburban gains yet. They're still gaining. Sure. And the Dobbs decision, that's a part of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, are you surprised? Not particularly. I mean, I, I'm less into the data than you, so I'm not sure how this went in 22 so in 2022... Is that when the swing happened? That's when the swing happened. Okay, I'm not following well yeah. enough. No, no, that's um, okay. So that's when the swing happened. So From it, 2018? No, no, 2022 to 2023. Oh. Like from November 2022 to right now, swung Democrat plus 15. Wow. Yeah. Wasn't... But Dobbs was before November 2022. What? Yeah, it was. Exactly. So so that's why I'm wondering. Oh, like, right. Dobbs hasn't happened between these two votes. Right. Dobbs. Ha yeah. So, yeah. So I don't know what really the, what the ch massive changes. I guess I like, I'm curious about these specific candidates. So the candidates don't have much special to them. No. They, they haven't really held high elected positions previously. Like they're not like big name ticket guys. No. Um, so name ID kind of goes out of the picture. Mm. I think it's a general vibe that I think suburbans don't like that donald trump is running it up in the republican nomination and they're not ready to fall back into the party ah that's okay. what i think and i th i mean we saw this in wisconsin too when we had the election for the supreme court judge mm. um recently i think in april mm. and that went to the democrat by or the liberal by 10 points mm. and i think that that momentum has been carrying over I think the Democrats are also building a very good Wisconsin machine hmm. that they didn't have previously. Okay. Um, but now I, I want to talk about special elections generally. Like what are special elections? So special elections are all the elections for legislatures that take place in between all of the general elections on the first Tuesday of November in most cases, right? So these are kind of used by political analysts to be a bellwether factors. Okay, well what is going to happen at the next general election? Well, we can use these to be estimates. That's what they do. Mm. So I want to run through the, re the recent history of these special elections, okay? So in 2022, the median swing, the median swing of 
a special election was Democrat plus one in 2022. Mm. Okay. In 2000, and what happened in 2022? The Republicans took the House very narrowly, but they lost a lot of their key Senate races. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we go to 2020, the median swing was Democrat plus four. Okay. When we go to 2018, the median swing was Democrat plus 10. 2018 was a massive Democratic wave year. Mm. So we can see when there's a massive swing in the specials, you're most likely going to see a massive swing in the generals, right? Sure. So now let's go back and let's look at 2022. So far, into, I'm sorry, 2024. We have two special elections so far this year, one from Maine and one from Wisconsin, the one we're talking about. And the median swing right now is D plus 12. That, that's over their D plus 10 in 2018, mm -hmm. where they had the massive Democratic wave. We only have two so far. How Can the Democrats keep up this momentum? But right now, what this is telling me is Democrats have a lot of momentum, a lot of momentum. I guess so, which I, I don't know. I am, I am surprised because it feels like to me, I mean, besides, well, you do have the Dobbs decision, um, but besides that, what is galvanizing these people like well, yeah is it is it fear of trump of a trump return like is it uh is it tiredness of the the woke um pr like narrative put forth by the republicans mm -hmm. i'm not sure i don't know what's causing it but it's interesting to see that it's definitely happening mm -hmm. and i think democrats republicans back in the 2010s and the 2000s Republicans used to dominate in special elections, used to dominate mm. because they used to win the college educated, uh, college educated voter who is a high propensity voter. Mm. Now that that's switched, the college educated voter is now a Democrat voter and they're high propensity. They vote more often. Yeah. They're willing to come out in a special election. You look at the crosstabs for these elections, these special elections have way more college educated people represented in them mm. than the general elections okay. all the time. Interesting. They also have, they're also more likely to have lower minority turnout as well. Lower minority turnout. Yeah, lower minority turnout. Okay. So this is like a whiter, more educated electoral base hmm. during these special elections. Okay. Well, that, because that wouldn't necessarily, I mean, more educated. Makes sense. Makes sense that you get a democratic swing. But you would think less minority less diverse turnout. Does not. I, I also, I wonder if instead of. A fear-based motive is, is this positive? Is this an approval of the way the economy is doing right now with our extremely low unemployment rate, rising wages? Is it an approval of some of the legislation that Biden has had passed in his in his term, Inflation Reduction Act, um, Chips and Science Act? Maybe. Maybe. I, I'm skeptical, again, because I just feel like... like I'm skeptical that the voter base is that informed. I'm. I, I don't know. I, I. I think that voters vote where their wallets at. Yeah. And how people's wallets are doing isn't terrible, but it's not the best. Because inflation still has happened. Yeah. They, so they, you still go to the grocery store and like I'm seeing. I still see a dozen eggs for eight dollars. Yeah. Like it's still. It's still difficult. The prices have stuck. They're not rising, but they're still stuck. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know. I think that may have to do with, you know, the governor, Tony Evers in Wisconsin is fairly popular. Mm. He's fairly well liked. He recently won re-election. I think that, you know, when we saw in 2022, Mandela Barnes, who was the Senate candidate, ran it up in, we did not expect it to be a one point race, but it was 50.5 to 49.5 with the Republican winning. So there's been left, left leaning movement in Wisconsin for a little while. Mm. But what separates this from 2022 is all who decided to come out. I don't think the Republicans are galvanized right now. They're just not. Sure. And Democrats are. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're seeing. No, that makes sense, especially when I do think about the leaders of the party. And although I do read a lot of Biden hate, that's just kind of a very anecdotal online perspective that I have. And I would think that on a grander scale, it seems like it should be harder to really hate or fear biden yeah than it would be to do for trump i think no matter what it is it will always be harder to hate or fear joe biden i i don't think there's anything the republicans could really smack him with that's going to make you afraid of joe biden the way people were afraid of hillary exactly i don't think it's possible i don't think you can brand him like that no
I don't think you can. They'll try. They'll always try. Yeah. Um, but so that is our Wisconsin election coverage. The only, I want to talk about something else going on recently. Um, we're going to stay on Wisconsin a little bit, but also branch out to Montana, North Carolina, and Colorado. I want to focus in on college towns across the country. College towns used to be somewhat of political battlegrounds and in a lot of cases used to be Republican leaning. Um, people forget this, but in 2000, uh, Gore and Bush tied for the youth vote. It's not always guaranteed that the young people vote Democrat. That's not written anywhere, yeah. and that's not how the history has been. So when we look at some of these college counties, specifically, let's focus on Dane County, Wisconsin. In 2000, Dane County in Wisconsin was Democrat plus 30. Now it's Democrat plus 55. That's a 25-point swing towards the Democrats. And it's Dane County is also such a huge population center that the political calculation of Wisconsin that, that Republicans relied on is shifting. So one of the guys who was running, uh, who ran the 2004 re-election campaign for George Bush against John Kerry, he said that this shift, that this massive vote in Dane County, this is a really, quote, this is a really big deal. What Democrats are doing in Dane County is truly making it impossible for Republicans to win a statewide race, and he's calling it the Republican killing Death Star. <laughs> um, <laughs> what a That's nerd, good. right? <laughs> That's good. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah. But now, between Dane and Milwaukee, and Milwaukee, Republicans are going to have a really hard time winning Wisconsin. And I think Wisconsin is their best chance to flip to Trump in 2024 in the presidential general. Yeah. And if we got a 2004 Republican strategist saying, guys, there is a Republican killing Death Star in Dane County, I don't know what Republicans are going to do if they can't even flip Wisconsin. Then you're looking at maybe flipping Nevada. You're looking at flipping um, – then, then you go to Michigan, Pennsylvania, but that's already really hard. I, I think Pennsylvania and Michigan will vote to the left of Wisconsin in every circumstance. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know where else – like besides – a texas like where else to even consider yeah yeah so i don't i don't know now but this isn't just a wisconsin thing so now i want to take you guys to uh, gallatin montana which i promise will probably be the only time you hear about gallatin montana on a podcast this year um it, it voted basically plus 30 republican in 2000 in 2020 it voted plus four democrat this is a massive shift among the college educated. It's a massive shift among the young. Mm. And these are also growing population hubs. Yeah. And that's what's so scary for these Republicans. You're losing massively populous counties that you used to win. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I'm so what do you know what college is in? Gallatin? I don't know what college is in Gallatin. It looks like Montana State okay. University. I do know there's a lot of influx of students from around the country going there now okay. and it's also becoming a tech hub oh it's becoming a tech hub interesting mm -hmm. okay i'm i mean when honestly when i think about college age voters or people in their mid-20s to me like still the dobbs decision just must just everything. ring so loudly in their memories right yeah. like it, but this this isn't counting 2022 data this is only 2020 data mm. this is not this is all pre-dobbs this okay. is only 2020 so it's just Trump. It's just, but it, it's 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 even more than that because we saw we saw a massive spike when we get to Obama, right? Okay. So Gallatin voted for Obama in Democrat plus four, okay. but then it swung back to Romney, and then it was even with Trump and Hillary, and then it went Biden. So there's a general upward trend. Obama bucked that trend by boosting all college age kids to go vote. Mm. Um, but now it looks like the it's just a general trend. Another county. Um, uh, uh, Buncombe County, North Carolina, um, used to be Republican plus 10. Now it's about Democrat plus 12. Then we have, uh, Larimer County over in Colorado used to be De Republican plus 15. Now it's Democrat plus 15. I mean, what's happening and what is happening? Why are the kids pushing so far to the democratic party? I think it's social issues. I think our society has changed. It's become mm. more open and the Republicans have become more nativist. They've mm. become more reactionary. True. They've, but now let's get off the social issues. Is there an economic basis to this? Is there a material reason mm. that, that kids are voting more democratic? 
possibly as far as the the cost of a house. Right. That's the main thing that comes to my mind. But besides that, I, I don't know if there are any material changes. Um, and I also don't know why why would you blame the rising cost of a house on either party that right? is a that is that is the failure of media right like to blame rising cost on any party is stupid it's super tied to interest rates yeah it's like totally out of political control and, and just supply and demand like yeah neither party has done a good enough job at supporting the development of new housing which yeah. is what has driven that price up. yeah there's some arguments that democrats would be more in favor of building more affordable housing but that doesn't mean they actually do build more affordable housing exactly um but i i think and i also think that there's been some movement among uh younger voters that actually see the damage done by reactionary forces mm. and i think that like they respect that more they actually saw how bad the trump presidency was and they then appreciated like okay we really need to get voting I see. So you see the Trump presidency as reactionary. I see the Trump presidency as very, I see the Trump, well, generally, I view the Trump presidency as a last, last gasp of a white majority scared of losing its power. Mm. That's how I view the Trump presidency. Okay. And that's not popular. It's an evangelical based movement. The base of the Republican Party is very very religious which is not a bad thing mm. i'm a very religious guy but when you start mixing that with politics it becomes a nightmare mm. um and it become it puts a sour it's taste alienating it's very alienating yeah it's very alienating to a group of people who are very open yes and don't want any type of alienation to anybody sure um and one party's running on that yeah, yeah. um and then we talk about but then you talk about student loans too I mean, these people are knowing that they're going to be burdened with student loans forever. Mm -hmm. And you have one party who's trying to do the right thing, give relief, make the student loan payments easier to pay off mm -hmm. by uh, decreasing the percentage that you have to pay towards your income for 20 years to get them canceled. Joe Biden took it from 10% to 5 mm -hmm. Um So why would a young person vote Republican? That's a genuine question I have. Yeah. What is the Republican Party offering a younger, middle-aged person? What are they offering you? Democrats are offering you um, easier, easier time paying off your student debt. It's offering you trying to get you child care for early development. Mm -hmm. It's trying to get you better health care coverage. The Democrats did get you health care up until you're 26. You can be on your parents' insurance plan. What is the Republican Party giving the young adult? Well, this is where I think the studies and research that's been done on why people vote is important because people honestly rarely vote for their own self-interest mm. like the reasoning is usually under 20 percent um and instead 60 percent of it is like out of ideological reasons or out of like a sense of duty to do the right thing mm -hmm. and there are still so many people who just think that even if it's not going to help them that making our economy more free market by reducing taxes is the right thing to do yeah even though the argument of the democrats is to implement more taxes on the wealthy and on corporations to redistribute to people who have less who are often going to be those right, right out of college yep. people yep so something is happening guys i i don't i i don't know how republicans can really pull out of wisconsin i don't want to say that because I don't want to like say Wisconsin's in the bag for Democrats and then be wrong. But if Dane County votes like this, how it did in these special elections and represents the same percentage of the statewide turnout, it's going to be really hard. Yeah. The signs are just pointing towards Wisconsin being blue. Yeah. And so far, it looks like the general election is going to be blue with the special election being a Democrat plus 12 swing. If that changes, we'll tell you. We'll talk about the next special elections that come around and we'll update that tracker. Yeah. But it's just interesting to know that right now we are currently at the same point as 2018, which yeah. was a massive Democratic wave. Yeah, I do want to. I want to bring this conversation. I know we've been here for a while, so I know, but this is a, this is the best topic, right? Yeah, now. this is really interesting. I, to does this support the idea of kind of trying to put the most milk toast candidate the Democrats have out there, or at least in this environment? Like as long as you are being driven by not only Trump, but even even you think you look at a DeSantis, and it's an incredibly oh, I evangelical. To, we have to talk about DeSantis. So yeah, a lot because a lot happened with him. But but I'm just saying, like, is it a good strategy to put out someone who doesn't evoke too much? Someone who is kind of straight down the center as far as a candidate, right? Because we're talking about 
this Democratic turnout coming because of fear of the Republican Party. And I was thinking even, like as we're saying, this is a trend that we've kind of seen since 2000. Maybe this is something that can be tied to the Supreme Court and Definitely. what the Roberts Court has been doing. Definitely tied to the Supreme Court. I think the, the younger generation is way more noticeable of the Supreme Court generally. Yeah. And so so having a, someone like Biden instead of a Bernie Sanders, right, could be really advantageous for Democrats as far as getting those swing voters. It's a hard question. I... I think Bernie would have done better in 2016 than Hillary. I think sure. if you ask the general population, I think they had a higher favorability of Bernie. Even currently, Bernie has a higher favorability nationally than Joe Biden as of right now, mm. um, with almost the same name recognition. But I do think there is something to having a guy at the top of the ticket who looks like he's just a leader and he's not a crazy guy. Like mm. There's something about having someone at the top of the ticket who looks like he's just going to be a steady hand of the party and not an activist pulling the party. Yeah. That just makes it more appealing. He's not a fiery ideologue. Right. And there's something appealing about that. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, there's a governor that we should talk about next week, Andy Bashir down in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. He's up for re-election in November. That's going to be an election we're going to talk about a lot. Um, Andy Bashir, I think, should be a national figure for Democrats. Mm -hmm. He's a Democrat. He's the governor of Kentucky. He has a 50% approval rating and 50% of Republicans approve of him in Kentucky. Wow. Andy Bashir is also pro-trans rights. He's pro-gay. And he actually leads a fairly democratic administration in Kentucky while still having popularity. And I think it's because of his moderate bona fides um, and his moderate reputation where he's able to appoint people to do the right things. But when he gets on TV, he doesn't look like somebody who's going to raise the red flag and, you know lead a Bolshevik revolution. Yeah, exactly. Um, not that Bernie Sanders would ever lead a Bolshevik revolution, but no. you know, but I, that's, I'm a, I that's love his Bernie. vibe. That's his vibe. And I love Bernie. I'm a Bernie guy. I campaign hard for Bernie. You know that. Yeah. Um, but I do think there is something to have a moderate at the top of the ticket. Yeah. Down ticket, I will always be for progressive running in a house or something, unless sure. it's like a super tight toss-up state. Well, it's just, again, it's just not scary. Right, it's just not scary. And so like, it's, it, it's safe to have the moderate Democrat win because they're going to they're going to evoke less fear in the voter base than a MAGA Republican, right. for sure. And there's more to this. It can't be too moderate. You know, I think there is actually a very tangible difference between a Joe Biden and a Michael Bloomberg winning the Democratic primary, right? Well, well, the thing is, Biden isn't actually really moderate. Right, right, right. But right. he, it's, again, it's the vibe. Yeah. Like, like versus you can have someone with an, a Bernie or an AOC type vibe in those heavily blue districts and i want them there yeah but but dial it down when you're on the national stage i totally agree yeah i totally agree um yeah totally okay i want to talk about let's stay on the presidential or like american political elections for a bit and let's talk about what's going on in the republican primary yeah so ron DeSantis is shit in the bed um it's really bad right now. Ron DeSantis has fallen to a distant second. I've seen some polls that have him tied with Vivek Ramaswamy for second. I'm not even kidding. Um, nationally, <laughs> we're talking Ron DeSantis 12, Vivek Ramaswamy 12%. Really? Th that poll wasn't that great, but the fact that that's even possible yeah. to happen. Well, that's the, like seeing Ramaswamy at 12 is kind of insane to me. I think it's insane. Yeah. Well, it's because he has so much media coverage right now. Yeah. He's just going on the airs every He's day. He's going yeah. everywhere, everywhere. yeah. Um, but I want to focus in on the early states of Iowa. We Early on in this podcast uh, journey that we went on, I said, watch out for Tim Scott. Tim Scott is, he is the danger to the Democratic Party. If Tim Scott gets the Republican uh, nomination, he will beat Joe Biden. Mm. I firmly believe that. Tim Scott will defeat Joe Biden in 2024 if he is the nominee. Do you think he's the only one who would? Yes. On this list? Um, I think Nikki Haley has an okay shot of beating Joe Biden. Okay. But I think Tim Scott runs away with it. Okay. I think Tim Scott literally runs away with it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So let's go into the Iowa polls. Here we go. You ready? Iowa. Donald Trump, 46%. Ron DeSantis, 16%. And then we got Tim Scott at 11%, Ramaswamy 6, Haley 5, Pence 4, uh, Burgum 3. Burgum's the governor of North Carolina, uh, North Dakota. So what do we gather from this? What do you gather from this information right now? I got two things from that. I, I guess I, my only thing is, is Scott. Yeah. yeah, it's Scott. What is Scott doing all the way up there? What is Scott doing at 11% in Iowa? 
What's happening? Why is he almost in the he's in the mar, he's basically in the margin of error with DeSantis in this poll? Mm. Trump is running away with it, obviously. But is Tim Scott now pushing himself as the Trump alternative? This is I think this is Tim Scott's moment. He has a forty million dollar war chest and he's about to unleash a buttload of ads in Iowa. Mm. He already has a pretty okay ground game, but Donald Trump has an amazing ground game in Iowa. I was reading reports that Donald Trump already has a hundred thousand cards of people who are willing to go out and caucus for him on election night already has a hundred thousand right now as of right now wow that's that, that's gonna be impossible to beat yeah but i think tim scott can go here and he can say i am your best shot of beating donald trump everybody stop wasting your money on desantis i think i'm the guy and we see this at a time when desantis is plummeting nationally yeah he's plummeting in iowa he's plummeting in new hampshire and he's also plummeting in south carolina in south carolina donald trump 48 percent Nikki Haley, 14%. She was the old governor. That's why she's up there. Mm. Ron DeSantis, 13. Tim Scott, 10. Tim Scott, Ron DeSantis in the margin of error. I don't think, I don't think, Ron, I've been saying Ron DeSantis doesn't have the stuff for a while now. Yeah. I think everyone else now knows that Ron DeSantis just doesn't have the stuff. You think so? I think everybody else now knows that Ron DeSantis does not have it. Interesting. Yep. Okay. I think Tim Including Scott's Including the, the Republican electorate. I think the Republican electorate is now knowing that Ron DeSantis is not the guy okay and if they're smart they'll know that tim scott is the guy to destroy joe biden i i th- i mean maybe to me saying that they know that DeSantis isn't the guy just means better news for trump like it means almost nothing for scott because it means that every non-trump vote is being split more yes. right it's, it's not being consolidated like yes. when i see this i mean we we kind of just breeze through it but in every state Trump is up oh, yeah. 30 points, yeah, yeah. at least. Yeah, it's not even a question. It's like Trump is obviously going to win these states. Yeah. So even like, like sure, I, I think I agree with you that Scott would have a good chance against Biden. He's the only one who's actually really running in a different lane Well, talk Trump. about, well, it, this is exactly what you're saying. Tim Scott is the type of guy who can be the moderate on the top of a ticket. Exactly. You know? Yeah. But too much of the Republican base doesn't want that. I, I honestly am, I'm less confident in Scott beating Biden, because I think the most of the Republican base would just Won't be so up. disappointed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that they wouldn't. Well, that's the argument from r- right wing populists. Right wing populists will say you're not going to get the rural Wisconsinite who voted Democrat for Obama and then voted Trump in 2016. You're not going to get him with a Tim Scott. Mm. Um, I don't know if I agree with that. I think you might still be able to get him, but. I do understand that it's not as exciting to the base. Yeah. That was the Democrat argument. You're going to say, if you have burning up the top of the ticket, you're not going to get the big turnouts in Dane County, Wisconsin. Mm. Um, you know, so I I, I don't know. Um, but I, I do know one thing. Scott's next opportunity is the Republican debate. Why? I don't think it's because debates matter that much. But I think it's because Trump has signaled that he doesn't want to participate in the first debate. He doesn't want to go. Sure. He's so high up in the polls, he's like, I don't, I don't want to go. Well, they asked Iowa voters, would it show strength or weakness if somebody skipped a debate? 27% of people said it showed strength, and 60% of people said it showed weakness. Guys, so this is the first time we're using a camera instead of our iPhone. <laughs> um, and we're not even using like the good camera on the back of an iPhone. We were, we've been using this front one. Yeah. That's what, So all you guys who are commenting like, Get a better camera. Like, dude, this was our camera. <laughs> like, this is what we've been doing. Um, so we're using an actual camera this time. And the problem is, for some reason, it caps at like 30 minutes of recording video. <laughs> All right. So even though I have a 128 gig SD card. And the there, battery is full. The battery is full. It just cut off. So we're going to have a few intermittent breaks. But we're just going to bring you back into the conversation nice and easy. Yeah, we're not going to do this every time. But I just wanted you to know that we're trying for you guys. And we're <laughs> trying to get better quality on the camera, we promise. Okay, so I was talking about Trump, Scott's opportunity. Mm. And it's not because I think he's going to, and it's coming up with the debate. I don't think it's because he's going to do well in the debate or that because debates matter. But because Trump's not going to go. And they asked Iowa voters, would it show strength or weakness if someone doesn't show up to a debate? 27% of people said it showed strength. said it showed weakness. And when asked about important qualities a leader should have, strength was number one. I think that this is an opportunity to show Trump's weakness. Maybe. But I I think Trump will go if he thinks there's any chance that it actually makes a difference. He hasn't said that he won't go, to be clear. Right. He hasn't said said he won't. I'm still thinking about it. 
Um, but that's honestly, wait a second, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot because I'm falling for Trump's game. Because I'm talking about whether or not he's going to go and making it all about him. Yeah. Wow, he's a marketing genius. But it is all about him. It is all about him. Yeah. I'm, an, I'm an idiot. I <laughs> fell for his trap. That's his whole game. And I fell for it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, because even honestly, could, sure, yes on this poll, but couldn't Trump kind of spin it as a show of strength to not go? Yeah. Like, I don't need it. Yeah. Let them, let them. Let them, pick, each other. Yeah, let, let them fight each other while yeah, I'm over here scraps. while I'm over here at a Wendy's buying food for everybody, which he does very frequently, but sometimes he doesn't pay, even though he says he would. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, any other comments about the Republican primary? Because that's kind of it for no. me. I, mean, I just think Tim Scott has a moment here. I think it's interesting. Yeah, it's slightly interesting. Honestly, the Republican primary generally just will never be that interesting because it will, I mean, maybe it will get interesting, Maybe. but I'm, I'm doubtful that it will ever be anything more than like Trump won. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to go international, but still staying on the political game. We had a massive election in Europe recently, the Spanish election of 2023. This was a very important test for a lot of reasons. Um, this was a, this was a, um, a snap election. Uh, the prime minister chose to have the election at this point um, because he wanted to consolidate more of his base and get more seats in his party. He thought he was going to win, but was shocking because the current leader, um, his uh, uh, prime minister, Pedro Sanchez, I knew his name was Sanchez. I didn't know Pedro. So Pedro Sanchez, um, he is leading the Socialist Party right now. He's the prime minister. During the May local elections, the Socialists got crushed by the Conservative People's Party, the Mm. PP, destroyed by conservatives across the country. And so when everyone saw that Sanchez was calling for a general he, they were like, why? And it's because he thought that he could consolidate some of the smaller parties into his party and boost the socialist party generally. Okay. Right? Because right now there's a massive coalition between the socialists, the communists, and then a whole bunch of regional parties, mm. especially in Catalonia. So he's thinking, maybe I could unite all those Catalonian small parties into the socialist party and we could have a bigger block. Okay. He's also doing a little bit to get back at the communist left, hoping to pick off some communist left seats back into the Socialist Party. Mm. Um, and the polls early on show that this was going to be a People's Party blowout. Um, we go back in May, June, like we're talking 33, 35% People's Party, 26% Socialist Party. Um, but there's also a third factor here. There is a new, relatively new party called the Vox Party. And the Vox Party is an ultra-right, ultra-nationalist party. Think of them as the alternative, uh, think about them like the AFD, the alternative for Deutschland party in Germany. Think about them as the hard-right movement in the United States. Think about them as the, the, the Le, Pen, Le Pen's party. Think about them as the, social de- uh, the, the Swedish Democrats in Sweden. Think about them as the, the party of the current prime minister of Italy. And the current prime minister of Italy actually voiced her total support for Vox prior to this election. Mm. So what's made Vox interesting is they have totally, totally imported the American culture war politics about trans people, about gay people, about the groomer culture. The Vox party was narrating that all over the country. Wow. They totally imported that talking point. So, and during the election... The People's Party was very, very reluctant to say that they would ever make a coalition with Vox. They were very, very nervous. The conservatives were very, very standoffish with the Vox Party because they didn't want to get tied to the most radical elements. The election comes around and the exit polls say that the conservative bloc is going to get 190 seats. I'm sitting in the library reading for this podcast and I see this happening. I'm like, damn, I can't believe it. I can't believe they really pulled it out. But then the election results started coming in. And they weren't that bad. And then I was waiting for them to get bad. And they never got that bad. And then it stayed not bad. And by the end of it, the socialists came out with more seats than the conservatives. And the socialist bloc had 172 seats by the end. And the the conservative bloc had 170 seats. Mm. You need 176 to form a majority in the parliament. So neither party can form a majority except um, if they don't have... um, Junta's parties uh, from the Basque region or Catalonia. Um, these parties are independence movements, uh, movements that want to uh, get the 
take uh, northeastern part of Catalonia out of Spain immediately, completely and have it be its own country. Really? You have a Basque independence party that wants the Basque region in the north of the country to be its own independent country. Yes, Spain is very, very fractured. So when I say that these little parties exist, wow. these are tiny regional parties that are vying for independence. Wow. Yes. And they have enough seats to be the kingmakers. So now now this is where everything is getting interesting here. I'm going to read this from a recent political article, the AP article talking about the election. Ready? The chances of Sanchez picking up the support of 176 lawmakers, the absolute majority, is very low. Mm. Um, the divide, the divided results have made the hardline Catalan separatists, the Hunts, together emerge as Sanchez's political kingmaker. If Hunts asks for a referendum on independence for Northeast Catalonia, that would likely be far too costly for the price of uh, for to po- costly a price for Sanchez to pay. He doesn't want to risk breaking up the country mm. um, naturally. Um, I've read some reports that the Hunts have already said that they're not working with anybody, which means that there will be another election in three months Okay. to fix this. And there'll be another election until somebody wins a majority. Do you think, do you think Spain might dis- dissolve? I don't think that anyone is going to allow them to. Catalan's been vying for it. Uh, Catalan, Catalan, what you guys are going to yell at me. Yeah. You're going to all yell at me how I pronounce it anyway. <laughs> um, they've been vying for independence for a while. They've had a long independence streak for the entirety of Spanish existence. Um, Spain united in 1492 under the, it was like the kingdom of Aragon and the kingdom of, of, of Castile. And then they united to form Spain. Mm. Aragon is that Catalonian enclave. And when Napoleon invaded in the 19th century, they were actually very pro French. Um, they were very pro the Republican movements in the French revolution, whereas the rest of Spain was seen to be a conservative backlash. So Barcelona, Catalonia, these are socialist strongholds. Mm. Um, so there's really no incentive for Sanchez to let them leave the country electorally. Um, huh. Yeah. But so now let's, let's go back on what the right is thinking about this. Vox, which had hoped to force its way into power, um, as many other far right parties in Europe have done, lost 19 seats from four years earlier. The Vox party went from 20% of the vote. Now they're down to like 12% of the vote or something like that. They got crushed. Why? I think that, well, this is what, here we go. You ready? It seems that the specter of far right taking a seat in government, albeit as a junior member, for the first time since the 20th century dictatorship of Francisco Francisco Franco has proved to be the key to the left's resurgence. Ah. People got scared. People genuinely got scared. The Vox Party was also flirting with giving the monarchy more power. Wow. The Vox Party is, yeah, they're no joke. And I think people recognize like, oh shit, we have to stop these guys. And- the fact that the People's Party, the, the right-wing, center-right conservatives weren't saying that they weren't going to work with the Vox Party actually scared a lot of people. Interesting. Huh. There's that a, makes sense. And, and there's a dynamic going on in Germany right now where the leader of the Christian Democratic Party, um, that was the party of Angela Merkel. Um, people forget Angela Merkel in the United States, people forget. In Europe, they don't. But in the United States, Angela Merkel was the leader of the conservative party, hmm. right? Um, so her successor now is flirting with the idea of siding with the alternative for Deutschland in local elections to form majorities at local levels. The tolerance for Deutschland is the is the ans- is the is the result of the Nazi Party, and the Christian wow. Democrats are now saying that they would let them in government. And we've seen this dynamic in Sweden. The, 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 the neo-Nazi party, the Swedish Democrats, literally formed by neo-Nazis. I'm not saying that as like, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. They were formed by neo-Nazis, is now in the Swedish government mm. because of a coalition with the center-right parties. Wow. We're talking about the finance minister of, of, of Sweden being a member of a former neo-Nazi slash current neo-Nazi party. <sighs> Europe is having a moment here. Mm. And the United States is having the opposite, which I think is great. The United States is having an opposite moment. Really? We're having a... Because we're, we're beating the fascists here. I mean, but the, the fascists are still in the minority in all of these European countries. Yes, but they're not in as much power. I suppose. I don't know. The, the fascists have a decent amount of power here. No, I know. I know. Especially on the local levels. I mean, let, let's... Let, but federally, the Democrats have the White House. The Democrats have the Senate. Yes. The Democrats look like they're going to retake the House. Like, there, there's... I don't see... It's not as bad okay. right now, currently. It could switch. Okay. But the... Fa- I mean, the fascists aren't 
aren't heads of state in any of these European countries, are they? In Sweden, they are. Oh, I thought you just said the finance minister. Oh, yeah, but he, they're in the ruling coalition. So when you're in the ruling coalition, the prime minister might be the conservative, okay. right-wing conservative, but then different cabinet positions are, sure. you have to be a certain percentage, have to be Swedish Democrats. Okay. And the Swedish Democrats get concessions to power mm. to make this guy prime minister. Sure. Um, so at the moment, the the United States is political... Um, palette is a little further left than a lot of the countries in Europe. And I'm happy that the Spanish at least delayed it because <laughs> maybe it comes around like three months from now, the Vox party gets like 20% of the vote. Uh, Who knows? But that was the Spanish election. Very big deal. Um, one of the most important elections of the year easily. And there'll probably be a second one that we'll be talking about. Exciting. Exciting. Um, let's go back to the United States. Um, I have an important story that's very much under the radar. Nobody's talking about it. It's not right. It's gross that nobody's talking about it. And it's a reminder to everybody that racism is deeply rooted in this country. And it has not gone away, no matter how much we wish it did. So a black man was elected mayor in rural Alabama, but the white town leaders won't let him serve. Um, this is taking place in Newborn, Alabama. It is 85% black and 29% of the black residents um, live below the poverty line. Um, two years ago, this uh, Braxton, this is the, the man who, who ran for mayor and isn't being allowed to serve. Um, he was the only, he saw firsthand many times where the town was just soaked with systemic racism. Uh, one of the first examples he recalls was there was a fire in a black neighborhood and he was the only volunteer fireman who showed up and white firemen were trying to take the keys away from him to stop him from going to the fire to put it out. Um, unbelievable, unbelievable. So he gets to power and he has not only been locked out of town halls um, and he's been, he has been followed by a drone and unable to retrieve the town's mail and financial accounts. Um, the previous mayor, Haywood Woody Stokes III, the former white mayor, along with his council members, reappointed themselves to the positions after ordering a special election that nobody knew about. Uh, this is just a rejection of democracy. Yeah. Uh, like, absolutely insane that this is happening in America. We're letting it happen. Where is the Department of Justice? Where is Mayor Garland? What is happening right now? Uh, I mean, did, again, you're saying... We didn't know about it. Or like we haven't known about it until recently. Yeah. Do, they, do they even know? Do they even know? Do they even know that this is happening? This is a small town. This is 300 people. You're like, oh, who cares? This is the foundations of democracy. If we're not going to have democracy at a local level and we take it for granted that it doesn't matter, what are we even doing here? Yeah. This is the most fundamental American principle. And this, this town is emblematic of what happens when good people don't do anything. And they let the bad people run wild. And that's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. We have reports that for 60 years, there has never been an election in the town. For 60 years, the mantle has been treated as a hand-me-down by, by the small percentage of white residents, um, according to several residents um, that the this reporter interviewed. After being the only one to submit, this is how Braxton got to power, by the way. He was the only one to submit qualifying paperwork and a statement of economic interests. He was the only one to do so. There was nobody else on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So or there wasn't even a ballot. He was the only one to submit. He, he won, right? Um, uh, and despite what they know for sure, despite what everyone knows for sure, there ha was never an election and Stokes had been in office since 2008. This white mayor has been in office since 2008 and nobody can remember there ever being an election. That's crazy. 14 years, 15 years. They didn't even know that there was an election. It's literally just monarchy on a t on a small scale, and it, it's like a club. That's yeah. what that's what these, these people are treating the politics like a club, and it's not. It's unbelievable to me that we're letting it happen. I mean, this is just like this is racism at its finest. This is an example you know? that Reconstruction failed. We didn't do a good enough job of rooting out racism in this country. We didn't finish the job, mm. and because we didn't, we're dealing with this. 150 years later or whatever it is because we didn't end it then um so 
after Braxton won the mayorship, Stokes and the formal council members called a secret meeting to adopt an ordinance to conduct a special election on October 6th because they allegedly forgot to qualify as candidates. They actually said that. They said that they, they forgot to qualify as candidates, so we're just going to change the election date. What is going on? If Braxton forgot to qualify as a candidate, would you have changed the election date for him? No. Of course not. Of course not. So they're filing a lawsuit for this, which that's great that they're at least filing a lawsuit. But what we need to, what we, the, the lawyer who took up the case, her last name was Lewis, and white residents found out that Lewis was helping Braxton. She began to receive death threats. She received handwritten notes in the mail with swastikas and derogatory names such as the N-word and the B-word, and one of the letters had a drawing of her and Braxton being lynched. So when we see court cases that we talk about that say that the country is in a different place than it was and it needs different solutions, you're fucking wrong. When we talked about the pre-clearance aspect of the Voting Rights Act being taken out, where election-related laws didn't need to get pre-clearance from the Department of Justice. This is the result of that. Mm -hmm. So when Antonin Scalia wrote in that opinion that we are a different country, or Roberts, whoever it was, said that we're a different country now and we need different solutions, where's your solution, John Roberts? Because right now a black man who should be the mayor is getting locked out of town hall and pictures of him being lynched are being sent to his lawyer. Yeah, it seems like that is actually exactly the solution that we need right now. Yes, exactly the solution. And I, he is running for um, mayor again in 2025. I'm going to be donating his campaign. I hope all of you guys chip in five bucks to his campaign. It's a small mayorship. Um, I hope that he's able to win. And another terrible part of this is the American Rescue Plan funding that went to this town for 300 people was 30 grand which is pretty good for 300 people. Um, there is no accounting on where that money went. He looked for the accounting. I wonder. I wonder where it went, Mayor Stokes. Yeah. To be clear, if you want to rep- support him, it's Patrick Braxton in New Bern, Alabama. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. He's got a website set up. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go get him some money. Let's start a movement. Yes. Yes. Honestly, unbelievable. Um, just it, it just it goes to show you that anybody who tells you that racism isn't around just it, it shows their ignorance and they just don't know. Because yes. if you know this is happening, you should there should be a fire in your stomach ready to pull down the establishment until they do something about this. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it just breaks my heart. I it really it just makes me hope that the DOJ has been alerted. Yeah that this is happening yeah because they need to be doing something yeah they need I mean, to do something. And again it's a it's a town of 300 it shouldn't be hard for them to enforce the worst democracy. part the worst part about this article is that it gives two more examples of towns where this has happened really this isn't the only one i don't remember the towns but there's one in mississippi wow and there's another one in alabama wow. that have elected black mayors and then have not been allowed to serve and this isn't, listen, this is the history of the South. There, there was a coup in the United States, um, in North Carolina, where they had a black government and the white people, the white opposition just burned them, chased them out of town and took over the government by force. This isn't new to America, politics of, of white people taking power away from black people when they've earned it the right way, mm. you know? Um, and it's just, it's a... It's, I just want everyone to understand that the legacy of racism isn't just a legacy. It's current. It's the world we live in. It's not one of an imagined past that we look back on and feel bad about. It's one that we need to consistently push against and fight to change. Yeah. I have nothing else to I add there. I have nothing there. else. So that is about local politics, international politics. Now we're going to do probably our most common geopolitics we have some news out of the ukrainian russia front yeah so this is pretty big um there the the ukrainians seem to have blown up part of the kerch strait bridge so the kerch strait divides um a part of russia from the crimea 
in in the Ukraine. So there's it, it kind of it it is a divide between or uh, that goes into the Sea of Azov, uh, and this has been the main line that the Russians have been using to deliver its supplies and troops to the front. The bridge was damaged um, last August, I think, but the Russians were able to repair it pretty quickly. Uh, but with this explosion, there is now just one rail line that is still able to go over the bridge, but it can only carry light cargo. So the Russians are seriously inhibited from getting food, ammunition, weapons to its troops on the front, right? Meanwhile, the Russians, a few months ago, you guys probably remember this, they blew up a big dam, okay? This flooded the Ukraine, or this flooded the Crimea, uh, and the the areas near Kyrgyzstan and Zaporizhia. And it also meant that there is no longer a lot of water in the dam. So once it's time to grow food in southeastern Ukraine, in the Crimea, where all of these Russians tro- Russian troops are, they're not going to be able to do that. They're not mm. going to have the water to do it. So right now, because of this explosion, the Russians are seriously cut off from their main supply lines. It's really the best opportunity that the Ukrainians have had and probably will have to make a breakthrough mm-hmm. on the front. Because if you're able to cut off the supply line from this bridge, and then you're hopefully able to get a pincer movement over into uh, Mariupol, mm-hmm. you can totally cut off the Crimean Peninsula and the southern front yes. of the Russian army. So they're probably looking to do that. Of course, the problem is even if these troops are, are undersupplied and they don't have enough food, there's still enormous minefields mm-hmm. and shark teeth that are going to block any Ukrainian vehicles, right? So it's not as simple as just the troops are under supplied and the Ukrainians can cut right through. Yeah. They still have a lot of work to do. I haven't seen any news on, I mean, the, the bridge was blown up about a week ago uh, on whether there's been significant progress on the front since then. No, there hasn't been. So, and there, there's a couple of reasons to that. Um, but about the bridge, the way that they destroyed the bridge this time is really interesting to me. Hmm. Last August or whenever the bridge was first destroyed, it was because of a truck that was driving from Russia to Crimea that blew up. And it was probably Ukrainian sabotage. I don't think they ever claimed it. Um, Probably, most definitely, Ukrainian sabotage. But since then, they've had very intense checkpoints prior to getting on the bridge. And so that that way of destroying the bridge was shut off. This time, they used a drone that flew under the bridge and then exploded. Mm Mm-hmm. Russia has pretty good air defense systems, uh, or so I thought. Russia controls the entirety of the Black Sea. Mm-hmm. Russia controls the Sea of Azov. Russia controls all of southern Ukraine. How do they fly this drone over there without it getting shot down? If Ukraine can reliably do this and keep destroying the bridge, yeah, this is a really big thing. If this is something that the Ukrainians can shut off, keep the bridge offline consistently, this is really good news for them. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm skeptical just because this is the first... And only time it's happened. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I'm, I wonder what the story is. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but it should be very advantageous for Ukraine. And I, I don't know. I, I hope that they can make a breakthrough. But Obviously. I, but if they can't, if they can't do it now, then they, they won't be able to. Right. I'm, I, one of the things I was reading was Ukraine has a very massive artillery shortage, and that's why mm-hmm. the United States is sending cluster munitions, or so we say it's because of that. I, I, I'm actually t- kind of inclined to believe it, because NATO as a whole is actually undersupplied with our artillery weaponry. We don't have a lot of artillery ammunition. Um, a lot of it is because of our European allies not producing enough. Russia fires 20,000 shells every single day. Ukraine probably fires 5,000. Ukraine would love to fire 2,000 shells a day. If Ukraine could fire 2,000 shells a day, we might be having talking about a different war right now. Um, but prior to the Ukrainian invasion, the German stockpile was 20,000 shells. The German, the nation of Germany's stockpile was how much Russia shoots in a day. Yeah. There's only three, 300,000 shells produced every year on the European continent. I mean... That's what? What is that? Uh, quick math. Quick math. Um, how many How many days is that? The yeah, Russia wait, you said 30,000? 300,000. It's 15 days. 15 days. Jeez. 15 days worth 
of fighting. That's wild. That's all that the United. That's all the European Union can produce in a whole year. Mm. And so what that means is they need to up their artillery production. Well, how do you do that? Um, you have to buy artillery from weapon manufacturers. Well, guess what, guys? The weapons manufacturers aren't set up to be producing more than $300,000 a year. They're going to have to invest in R&D. They're going to have to invest in real estate. They're going to have to invest in development in order to make that. Yeah. And no military... Duh, um, no military uh, armaments facility is going to want to construct all of this new material just for a couple of years from now to Germany say, you know, I'm not buying anymore after the war is over. That's the issue. There's no long-term investment. Mm-hmm. Um, the solution that some people are suggesting is treat it like the COVID, vac- COVID fight. Mm. Have just say, like, we are going to buy 100,000 masks from you, period. Mm. And then like a guaranteed contract type deal. That makes it worthy of it. But I don't even know if that solves the, pollu- the solution long term. Because if they do all this investment into a long term operation, like they're not going to want to just be sitting on all of this stuff, all of this, all of these development facilities to make ammunition that's not being used. I, I think I think yes, but I also wonder I wonder if it's yes and no. Because I wonder if the rising geopolitical tension in the world and deglobalization means that suddenly these countries might be more interested in having a bigger stockpile that might be true like russia's not that far from germany maybe they feel like it's in their best interest to have a little bit more a little bit more artillery well poland is now going to be spending like five percent of its gdp on the military now exactly and so they're definitely going to be spurring some artillery production Mm -hmm. but i just thought that was so interesting european union produces three hundred thousand a year that's 15 days of Mm -hmm. russian fighting what were they doing for all these years? They really thought they could just bring Russia into the fold, no problem. Yeah, they thought those those oil supply lines meant that nothing would ever, would ever happen. Economic connection is supposed to mean peace. Liberalism is wrong, guys. Yeah. Liberalism was fucking wrong. All right, guys. So, book club. We are reading uh, Supreme Inequality by Adam Cohen, The 50-Year Battle for More Unjust America. We are going to be talking about how the Supreme Court decisions... Um, of the late 20th century and early 21st century impacted the rights of corporations, expanded their rights, gave them more power over things like class action lawsuits and punitive uh, and punitive payments. And we're going to be talking about all that in depth. Mm-hmm. And we're going to begin our story in 2008 um, that arose out of an Exxon oil spill mm. in 1989. So what happened there? I don't know. Oh, you don't know? I kind of know. Oh, damn. I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that, man. I'm sorry. You're good. I, right. I, I kind of know, but not enough to give like the full context of the story. Okay. So I, I can do a quick sharp spark nose. Yeah. We got lot, lots of damage to Alaska fishermen because of this oil spill. The captain of the ship was found to be drunk and had a long, long history of being an addicted alcoholic. Mm. Um, a 1994 jury found Exxon totally responsible for putting him behind the wheel. And with this... 10,000 fishermen's livelihood was directly affected because of the damage it did to their fishing waters. So Exxon was forced to pay around $500 million for uh, damage payments, okay, for just regular damages. Compensatory damages. What is it called? Compensatory damages. That's perfect. Okay, so there's compensatory damages. That's number one. Then there was also a $5 billion amount charged for punitive damages that, uh, that was you know a way way higher amount than the damages and that's what the important dynamic to look at here is the damage what is it called compensatory compensatory damages was 500 million and then the punitive damages was 5 billion so the point of punitive damages is pretty much to punish companies it's supposed to be like you did a really bad thing and even if it only caused 500 million in actual economic damages Mm -hmm. we are doing this to teach you and every other company a lesson of how much we care about you not doing something that's this harmful negligent um and bad for the little guy basically it's a it's a a tool of deterrence yeah it's a deterrence tool right it's like yeah it's like you it's like spanking your sibling Mm -hmm. in front of your kid it's like because you know what's going to happen to you um not saying that I would spank my kids. I don't know why I use that analogy, but it's just <laughs> it is what it is. Um, 
So Exxon was not okay with this. They appealed it to a judge. The judge brought it down to $2.5 billion, mm-hmm. But even that wasn't enough. They took this case all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in 2008, the Supreme Court said that they did not have to pay the punitive damages as it broke the due process clause. Now, what do they mean by that? When they're saying it broke the due process clause, Exxon is arguing that we didn't know how much the, the fee or the fine was actually going to be for this. And because I didn't know what the punishment was, you can't lop a bit, a drop a big punishment on me. And I didn't even know what it was going to be. Yeah. Um, which like isn't the worst argument. I think that's actually a fine argument. I think people should know the consequences of bad actions. Except that there had been precedent, long-standing precedent, mm. that punitive damages would be used like this deterring deterring factor. Yes. And that you I mean it's it's almost it's hard to say that there can be a specific amount because this is one of those where it really is such a case by case basis of like how bad of a thing did the company do. Yes. So with that punitive damage decision, there were many people who were confused why Exxon would even cite the punitive damages part mm. because this clause has nothing to do with corporations. It only has things to do with individuals. Mm. The law doesn't mention corporations. This The due process clause comes out of the 14th Amendment, which was a reconstruction amendment meant to make black people more equal to whites in America. Mm-hmm. This had nothing to do with corporations' right for punitive damage claims. How are these two things being tied together? It's part of a long game. <laughs> it's yeah. a part of a long game. Exactly. You know, they're laying the seeds. They're doing what Justice Powell told the U.S. Commerce Secretary of Commerce or Chamber of Commerce to do all those years ago. Yeah. That we talked about if you're OG on this show, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So let's now we're going to rewind. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, it was it was part of this conservative movement mm-hmm. where the business class saw punitive damages as a really huge cost that was hitting the bottom line. Right. And so. The, the Exxon case was an example, but there were other ones that had came before the Exxon case ended up being decided that were leading up to this to this cap. Yes, and there's a whole movement in the 1970s ta- uh, talking about tort reform. Mm-hmm. So what's tort? I had no idea what tort was, to be honest with you. Torts is a negligent or intentional action that causes harm, mm-hmm. which could be anything from a defective product to fraud. So tort reform advocates were saying that there was an over amount of litigation to these types of cases with runaway juries posing enormous punitive damages that were not fair. And they wanted this reformed so that punitive damage either could be more outlined exactly what they would be or just lowered, period. Yeah. You know, or uh, I don't know what they were thinking, but eliminated. And yeah. this is when the term like frivolous lawsuit kind of became popular. And the good example is that old woman who spilt McDonald's coffee on herself. And everyone was like, she spilt hot coffee on herself. And she became a millionaire. I Please go back and actually understand what that case is about. She was served coffee that was so hot. It burned her skin to such a degree she had to get skin grafts. Yeah. This is not like a this is not a frivolous lawsuit. No, she was literally inhibited from like fully moving for years. She was disabled. Yeah. And then they these guys pushing for tort reform framed as this frivolous lawsuit. It's unbelievable, man. Yeah. And so what they were pushing for was punitive damage caps. Mm-hmm. Um and at this time, they weren't popular with the Democratic establishment, so nothing was being passed on the federal level. Mm-hmm. You know, the, during this time period, the Democrats controlled the House for a very, very long time. Um, so nothing about this was going to be getting through. Um, but now the court, it's a different story. They had the power. They had all the power. Yeah. Conservatives were in there. So now we get to 1996. And so this is, our, this is the first case we're going to be talking about. BMW of North America v. Gore. That's the one. Yeah. So... This one I can't explain. Okay. So, Dr. Ira Gore, he was sold a car under false pretenses. So, this car from BMW had had suffered damage from acid rain, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so, its, its surface and its paint coat had been damaged. And BMW decided to just slap a new coat of paint on it and sell it to him anyways without ever saying anything about it. Um the compensatory damages were probably about four thousand dollars. I think it was four thousand dollars. It's around there, yeah. But the court awarded him four million in punitive damages because it said BMW's policy constitutes gross, oppressive, or malicious fraud. Mm. 
because they hid it. Exactly. They weren't upfront about it. That was the issue. And it was also baked into their policy. Their policy was if the damages wasn't more than 3% of the price of the item, then they would just forget about it. Exactly. So it was revised to $2 million in punitive damages on appeal. And then it went to the Supreme Court, who ruled 5 to 4 that the $2 million was excessive and it violated due process. There we go. What's important to know at this time is it's not totally ideological yet. There are still some liberals who voted in favor, Mm -hmm. and there are some conservatives who voted against. So this isn't a total ideological fall yet. Well, as far as I know, it it stays mixed. No, it doesn't. It ends up being hard line. Really? Yes, it ends up being hard line. Okay. Yeah, there. When it gets when it gets to the later years. Yeah. Okay. When it gets to the later years. Okay. Yeah. For years, for years, it's mixed because there are liberals who like the idea. Of more specific defined punishments. Yeah, what I just said. You should really, honestly, you should know what the punishment is for your crime. Yeah. That's only fair. Mm. That makes sense. I agree with that on principle. That I get that. But it, as we'll get into, it's not the court's place to decide the punishment. It's mm-hmm. not what the court is supposed to do. That's what the legislature is supposed to do. If they're not doing it, then they're not doing it. Mm-hmm. So in 2003, we have another case like this. State Farm is encouraging a client to go to court to fight an insurance battle for an accident. Mm-hmm. And State Farm is so confident in this case. They're like, look. Go fight it. If you lose, we will pay all your lawyer fees. We'll literally cover the entire cost. There's no risk for you. So he's like, okay. So instead of having to pay the 50 grand, he had to pay 185 grand after he lost. State Farm was wrong. Hmm. And then State Farm was like, screw you, man. Uh, we're not paying you the money. You yeah. shouldn't have trusted us. Why'd you do that? You're an idiot. Um, and so this guy, Campbell, this guy had Parkinson's disease. He was, and he was caught, and he was caught in State Farm strategy to limit payouts. Like the goal here um was they were targeting people specifically for this literally it was it was like let's prey on the weak because they're not going to be they're not going to know their rights and be able to sue us to actually get us to pay what we agreed we would pay this is the policy of a massive corporation this is their goal this is literally what they're going to do they're telling you right now yeah it's like in writing like unbelievable so campbell won the case against state farm and was given one million in compensatory damages um and 145 in punitive damages um i mean that's what you love to see (laughs) yeah yeah like with this kind of thing again it seems like that's the type that's the size of a slap on the wrist that you should be going for yeah when you're literally having it in your books yeah preying on the weak yeah but the court said this was too much and this is a big step because the court put a specific number Mm. on how much more should punitive damages be able to be than the compensatory yes and they suggested that punitive damages should be less than 10 times compensatory damages yes which so again, a ratio of one to one to nine yeah goes back to what you were saying about this is this is clear law judicial making. lawmaking this is just lawmaking yeah there's no if ands or buts about it this is just lawmaking literally there's nothing about punitive damages in any law or not any law but like any like nothing that the legislature has passed is regulating punitive damages no why is the court regulating punitive damages what is happening it's it, it makes no sense and so no. We're limiting the amount of punitive damages for um, less than 10, right? So Ginsburg said the court was, in her dissent, she said the court was changing the law on punitive damages very quickly in favor of corporate defendants. Um, Jury, she said that juries were trying to send a message against companies like State Farm. And this this is the term, weakest of the herd. That was their term. That's what it was. Quoted, weakest of the herd. (laughs) What a bunch of assholes. What is wrong with them? What's wrong with them? And then it's, it's just it's just like it's it's cinematic. It's like, like, a, it's like, like an it's, Austin Powers villain. It's yeah, so funny. It's it's ridiculous how evil it it's, is. It's like it's like the bad guy's name being Doctor Evil. Right? Yeah, like that's <laughs> and that's that's like what the corporations of America are like, unironically. Yeah. yeah. So then there's another massive case with Philip Morris. Philip Morris is the big cigarette company. They were like big. Big, big, big battles in the 90s and 2000s for cigarette regulation. So in 2007, an Oregon jury ordered Philip Morris to pay a pay widow of Jesse Williams $821,000 in compensatory damages and $80 million in punitive. Oregon, Oregon Supreme Court was disgusted that the company knew about the terrible effects of tobacco but continued to lie to the consumers over the years. Mm-hmm. So this is an example of 
punitive damages being a strong deterrent factor. Yeah. They're going up to Philip Morris and they're saying, listen, you lie to your consumers. We're going to show that if you lie to your consumers, to anyone else, any if anyone else lies to their consumers, they're going to be hit with the, they're going to be, a hammer is going to come down on them. Yeah. Um, so Philip Morris v. Williams, it was ruled five, so they appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. Philip Morris won 5-4 um, with, again, liberals and conservatives on both sides. It's not ideological yet, which this one shocked me. Like, the fight against the cigarette companies was very ideological. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it shocked me because the the rationale and the decision felt super shaky. Like, it felt really unconvicted to me. And... Th- what they said was that they expected that Philip Morris, and I think it was Stevens wrote this, or it might have been Breyer, um, it was it was one of the liberal justices, that they worried that Philip Morris was being punished for plaintiffs that not represented yes. in the case. That's kind of the point. Yeah. That's kind of the point. Exactly. Um, yeah. Like, I, I, it's supposed to, like, I think Bre- Breyer's taking issue with the fact that the compensation is... Not just for the person suing, but the whole point of punitive damages is to be a larger social outlook mm-hmm. and a, painting a social picture of what the companies are should be allowed to do. And it's like he's taking issue with that whole concept. Mm-hmm. So when this comes out, the New York Times was disgusted by the ruling, and there was a Harvard Law Re- in uh, article in the Harvard Harvard Law Review. Um, that said they had turned the 14th Amendment into a tool of the rich and powerful when it was supposed to be a tool for the least of these. Great quote. Yeah. And I, I totally think that the 14th Amendment has just been totally co-opted. Yeah. Especially after reading about these cases, just totally co-opted. Unbelievable. Absolutely. I, I actually had a call with my mom today who was a public defense attorney for her whole career. And we were talking about like the affirmative action case recently, which also co-opted the 14th amendment um just in the in the idea of spirit of the law versus letter of the law and she said yeah like yeah i'm I'm definitely on the side of spirit of the law and the more we learn about these cases the more that i'm firmly on that side as well and that i would assume that 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 should be like taught in law schools like that should be the basic assumption right right? you're interpreting based on what they meant by the law and you're trying to apply that to the specific case Mm -hmm. that you're reading um so the idea that that it's a problem that they're trying to make a larger societal statement here with the punitive damages makes so little sense because that that is the spirit that is the spirit of the law yeah that is the spirit of punitive damages exactly yeah that's what their goal is so we see this again, we see this ratio come up, the punitive to compensatory damages ratio come up in that Exxon case that we were talking about before. Mm-hmm. And what, what blew my mind, literally blew my mind, I couldn't believe this when I was reading this, during that Exxon case, the court just decided that the ratio is at least, is, at, is like one to less than 10 times, right? They just decided that. Well, now, during this Exxon case, they decide, well, you know what? This has to do with maritime law. And since that was more complicated, the ratio should be one-to-one. They just changed the ratio. Yeah. I, 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 but why? You just <laughs> made it. You, you literally just made up a law. You literally just made it up. Yeah. Saying that it should be at no more than 10 times. And now you're saying it's no more than one time? Which you're also making up on, on grounds, on rationale that... that- has absolutely no connection. What, what does maritime question law here? have to do with any of this? Yeah, why would that change whether how much the punitive damages should be? Why? So Ginsburg <laughs> said, if there were to be a ratio on punitive damages, it should come from Congress and Congress alone, not made up by the court. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and mm. it, it, the idea that they were just so willingly able to change the ratio after making the ratio themselves. Yeah. It's just disgusting. I don't understand. I don't understand. No, like, I someone explain to me. And I, I also, I don't understand how how the liberal justices talked. I mean, we we talked about where their mindset came from, but punitive damages are purely a punishment to corporations, yeah, to massive corporations, right? That it is a balancing of the the little guy, the David with goliath that is the whole point of punitive damages yeah and that's the whole point of the liberal ideology so like where are these justices what are they thinking 
I, I don't understand. Well, so this is what they say in the book, right? This is the next part here. They say some liberals like the idea of capping punitive amounts on the belief that people should know what their punishments for a crime would be if they committed it. Mm -hmm. Yes, but this is the court, like you just said, taking away the broad power of punitive costs as an idea of deterrence. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not coming from Congress. I don't know why they got off on this. I, I'll never understand why this happened. And I don't understand why there isn't a legislative push to remove the cap imposed by the court. Like, I, reading through this book, it's really outlined to me, if I were to get into federal office, the exact things that I would push for. I would go back and I would try to remediate all of these cases through law, mm. through making new legislation. Yeah. That's what I would do right away. I would say, you know what, we're going to get rid of the punitive damage cap set by this case. We're going to go back and we're going to take away the McKay doctrine when, when we're talking about rights to organize and union labor. Like, I would go back and rectify all of these terrible decisions day one. Yeah. That's what I would do. Mm. It, it's funny because I think it would be tough, or at least with, with this specifically, right? Because say you enact that law. It goes to the Supreme Court, are, and you get a conservative court. Mm -hmm. Aren't they just going to say this violates the Fourteenth Amendment? Well, hopefully, statute should overwrite some of a made-up algorithm imposed by the court. I pray that statute <laughs> overrides a fake algorithm made by the court. You'd hope so. The problem. This is this is the huge problem with the court, though, because because their precedent is law right right and so now there's all of this evidence that's already in the books that says this is what the 14th amendment means mm -hmm. and they have all of this to support their cases because i i feel but, the same way as you but look at lily Le oh wait i have issues with this actually because this is an interpretation of a constitutional amendment but the lily ledbetter case was an ins was a was a was was not it was using statute and it was arguing about a specific aspect of the Civil Rights Act, which was made by Congress, not the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So if you use constitutionality in a Supreme Court decision, you can't statute your way out of it. Yeah. You can only statute your way out of it if the Supreme Court decision was in issues with statute. Damn, that sucks. That sucks. So that's just the way it is? Unless we get another amendment. What a nightmare. Are you fucking serious? Yeah, well, I mean, this this or could lead into a whole this, conversation. You, yeah, this is a whole other conversation. Yeah, but maybe you pass this during a liberal court, and then it passes. But that that's what we have to do in this country. What a nightmare! What a yeah. joke! All yeah. right, so I want to rewind all the OGs. We have, you might remember footnote four. Footnote four was discussing what types of laws should need to have strong scrutiny special scrutiny. special scrutiny yes and they described in footnote footnote four that discrete and insular minorities deserve special deserve special protection mm -hmm. under the equal protection clause well the modern court has determined that wealthy corporations deserve special protections from jurors possible biases against big corporations that is what's crazy to me is that the the four the footnote four isn't being used in the, that the 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 spirit of footnote four isn't being used to protect the poor, protect the disabled. It's being used to protect corporations about the fears that juries are so anti-big business that they're going to drop such high punitive damage causes uh, costs on them just because they hate them. So the corporations are a discreet and insular minority. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's insane. Insanity. Yeah. D to try to fit that square peg into that round hole that corporations could be an insular minority that's wild to me unbelievable so that's when we're talking about punitive damages we're going to switch gears a bit i think right mm -hmm. is the next case switching switching gears yeah i i mean if anything we can talk about how there was i think there was a part of the book that that it kind of rested here to oh, discuss yeah. how pro-business the court has become yes you're right so there was a study on how many or on on what percentage of supreme court decisions went in favor of businesses uh for from each court starting with the warren court to the burger court to the rehnquist court to the roberts court and each court got more pro-business from it was from 28 percent of corporate one cases during the warren court 
up to 64% of rulings being pro-business in the Roberts Court, which is wild. This study, another study found, or it, it was rating which justices were the most pro-business since 1946, mm-hmm. and it found Sam Alito to be the most pro-business justice and John Roberts to be the second wow. most pro-business pro business justice. See, and that's why I hate Alito the most, right there. Yeah. There's the there's the evidence. Sure. That's it. That's why I think he's the worst. Yeah. Um, so we're just getting more and more conservative justices. We're getting more and more further on the right of the court. We're now businesses are winning cases more often than regular people. Yeah. And it's just a it, it's a removal of what um the court had the opportunity to be. Right? Yeah. The court had an under the Warren court, they set a chart. Um, they charted a course that really looked like the court could be the the slingshot that David used to take down Goliath. Yep. You know. That was the point of it. That was supposedly. Right, supposedly. Right? I yeah. mean, I don't know. We've gone into the we've we've already talked about how it's not. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's supposedly could have been. when it was founded. Right. I I mean like it seems like that. It is the justice system. It's like the general idea of what the court is. That's what you think about it as. Yeah, right. I I mean that's what I think about it as. It right. seems that's cr- what I that's what I thought about it as. It seems well. It seems crazy that it would be a, an enforcement mechanism of the powerful, right? Which is what it has become, right? So unbelievable. Yeah. The next part is something I I I really am interested in the class action lawsuits. There's a whole movement against class action lawsuits. Mm. Um. So. Class action lawsuits made it possible for large numbers of employees, consumers, to band together and file a single lawsuit together. Mm-hmm. Why would you want to do this? It's because many poor and middle-income people could never sue on their own because the cost is too high. So if you band together, it's way more likely that you'll win, and it's way more likely you'll have the resources to keep the fight going. Yeah. Um, and I love the idea of them. I love the idea of a bunch of people who have been wronged by a company coming together and trying to take it down together. Definitely. It also you know? works for... Um, cases that are going to give smaller rewards Mm -hmm. because you're never going to sue for one person who's been um, robbed of ten dollars or fifteen dollars or twenty dollars but if a million people have uh then you do want to recoup those damages from a company definitely and some of the cases we've talked about previously i didn't know but were class action so one of them was king v smith um that was a class action one and the other one was rodriguez v san antonio independent school district was class action that was a really big case because that was the one that was talking about equalizing school funding okay yes and that was class action yes yes i do remember that now yes that was class action and also we talked about the walmart one i think this was last week yes we did right where um Walmart or the 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 court said that the women who were bringing the Walmart case didn't suffer a similar enough injury to bring it as a class action, and that's one of the biggest cases in history. the history of the court to limit class actions, mm-hmm. right? Like the narrowness that they required out of the injury that was imposed on the on the plaintiffs um, that discouraged so many more class action lawsuits from ever taking place in the future. It was cited a hundred it was cited one thousand two hundred times in the first year alone. And it was very frequently cited to overturn jury decisions. So th- that Walmart case was rampantly popular yeah. across the country. Um just unbelievable. In two thousand five, so prior to the Walmart case, there the con- Congress actually did do um reform for class actions in the sense of doing like tort reform they were on the side of trying to limit these frivolous class action lawsuits and congress enacted the class action fairness act and made it easier to move class actions from state to federal courts federal courts would be much more likely to be um conservatively appointed at the time so ed markey who's a senator from massachusetts um, was highly against it and called it what it was a payback for the big industries that owned america yeah, Ed Mark is a great senator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah. The other case that I have here is Caroline Berend, yep. um, who was prevented from suing Comcast because members of the class would be entitled to different damages. This one's crazy. So <laughs> if if you start with the Walmart case saying that the plaintiffs didn't suffer a similar enough injury, now it's like there's different amounts that they should get from the case and that means they can't sue together think of how think of the logical extreme of this you can think about literally cents Mm -hmm. of difference 
that means that they can't take it to class action. So for, for Comcast, something that's doing cell service, right, that could be about the number of texts that a person sends. Like right. what if they went two texts over the limit versus 10 texts over the limit? Now they can't be part of the same class? I don't understand. That's ridiculous. I don't understand. They, they said that people across states were all dealt harm in a different way. How? How? Yeah, I, Ex- I don't know. Explain to me how, please, please. For the love of God, somebody explain to me how. After this case, the a very popular headline was spread around, uh, the end of class action. And that's so depressing. Class action, I, I views, to me, I already said this, the sling in David, that David used to take down Goliath. And I, I, I can't think of a better way for regular people to fight back against the powerful than a class action suit. Exactly. Like, we're just, it, we're just seeing the tools of the of the poor of the underprivileged of the weak being stripped away like one by one mm-hmm. right i mean i feel like that's what this book is it's right. just seeing all of those taken yeah and this one it doesn't look like they're using constitutionality to justify these decisions so this could be changed by law yes right i think so so that's good to know everyone yeah. who's in congress who watches us <laughs> okay yeah. All of you. Yeah, all of you. Yeah. <laughs> all of the fu- all the congressmen who watch this. Um, forced arbitration. That is our next topic. Yeah. Okay, so corporations in many of their contracts to consumers and employees s- make you sign away your right to court. Yeah, you have to do forced arbitration within the company to figure out any problems that you may have. Yeah, like you know when you're on your phone and you download an app or, or go to a website and you have to check a box for terms and conditions? It's probably in It's there. probably in those terms and conditions, right. You have like a 50-50% shot. Mm-hmm. This was actually a liberal idea in the beginning. Yeah. Which is so interesting to me. Frank Sander, he's a big proponent of the idea. He was a liberal lawyer. Um, and he liked replacing the one-sized-fits-all policy of that, of which was court litigation, with a modern one that was tuned to each specific type of dispute. He liked that concept. I, I get that. Yeah. I get that. Because it is so costly to go to court. Exactly. So I was just talking about the, the progressive push or the liberal push for arbitration. Um, as an alternative to court cases because of the flexibility and hopefully because you could go through arbitration at a much lower cost. Right. Now, the issue with this, because it sounds great, the issue with this is when cases are brought to arbitration, it's not by juries or judges that make these decisions. Um, They're arbitrators that are appointed and bought by the corporations so the arbitrators actually have a very very strong incentive to rule in favor of the corporation that hired them yeah um there's one harvard law law professor elizabeth uh bothelet and she experienced firsthand that she was she was siding with customers in a lot of cases and then she was removed from all the cases in the future Mm -hmm. because the corporation decided that she didn't they didn't want to hire her anymore they thought she was a bad arbitrator you know um and arbitrators can cost $10,000 a day and make over a million dollars a year. So why would a judge, why would somebody go and be a public judge when you only make $200,000 when you could 5x your money? Yeah. And and it's so easy. Like you don't actually yeah. have to worry about the case. You just rule in the company's favor every time. Yeah. It, it's honestly, it, it is like the picture of corruption. It is quintessential corruption and it's encouraged corruption like it and 94 percent of the time these arbitrations are cited on the business yeah 94 percent of the time so this isn't what justice is being served here if you're just going in and voting with the corporation every single time you have to arbitrate a dispute it's ridiculous it's literally just a waste of your time it's absolutely ridiculous um so in 1991 there was a question now expanding to employees and 1991 could employees be forced to arbitrate legal disputes including discrimination cases with their employer robert gilmer wanted to bring a case about age discrimination but the company he worked for said that he could not as he was forced to arbitrate within the company Mm -hmm. i this is such a break from the civil rights act it's unbelievable (laughs) yeah it's like why even pass the civil rights act if you're gonna have forced arbitration they, it's the court just being like, oh, we don't have to worry about this anymore. So the court ruled against Gilmer, 7 to 2, said that they had to abide by the standards. 7 so, to 2. 7 to 2. So like the liberals were in yeah. on this. Yeah. The majority cited the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, but what's so interesting about the Federal Arbitration Act is that the word employee doesn't appear once. 
the act was specifically supposed to apply to two sophisticated businessmen. Where is the word employee in that? Mm. Where's the word employee there? Like, where is this? I don't hear it. Yeah, I I don't hear it either. Where is this coming from? Um, And so that's a real decimation to worker rights. Yeah, I mean, in the cases that that go back to the Arbitration Act afterwards just kind of strengthen it more and yeah, more. Right. They just keep citing the same part. Yeah. So there was a there was an Amex case where there was a restaurant that said Amex had um uh, had scammed it. I don't remember exactly what they, they were just done. using their monopoly power to charge fees that were too high. Yes, that's right. Um and so Amer- or this Italian colors restaurant wanted to go to court because the arbitration in this case would actually cost more than the damages amounted to. Mm-hmm. Um, but the court ruled that they had to go to arbitration again, relying on this arbitration act. The one other that I have here is Jacob Lewis v. Epic Systems, who looked to go to class action arbitration. Um, but And this was in like 2018, I think. And Neil Gorsuch said that the... Federal Arbitration Act required the arbitration to be enforced. And this was kind of the the nail in the coffin, in my opinion. Well, this one's crazy because you're, Lewis is specifically citing Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act, which guarantees workers the right to work together to protect their interests. Mm-hmm. So now corporations have figured out a way to kill collective bargaining in the United States. I feel like this isn't a, wasn't talked about enough to be as big of a deal as it is. This is the end of collective bargaining, period. Yeah. This is the end of unionization. This is the end of forming new unions if you fi- if you f- sign these forced arbitration agreements. Yeah. So don't sign them. Please. <laughs> so we say that, but then like... Then you're forced to because you need a job. And again, half of companies at least have them in their contracts. Mm-hmm. And this is what I was thinking about when I read this is like, man, once once a norm is established, right? And companies see that they can do this and not really lose any of their competitiveness as far as mm-hmm. signing on new employees. Of course they're going to. Of course. And it's just another sign. Again, we, we talked about worker power a lot when we read Stiglitz. This is annihilating worker power. It's just evaporating it. No, evaporating it. Then he talks a little bit about environmental protections. In 2009 in Alaska, a company pumped toxic wastewater into a lake. Just pumped toxic wastewater into a lake. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers gave it a permit. EPA never did. The corporation was permitted to drop enough toxic waste that it would have eliminated all life in the lake from the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, wow. And the people suing this were not allowed to come together in class action. So there was no way for them to individually win this case. Mm. And due to these different arbitration issues, there was just no way to sue and get the EPA the power that it deserved in this case. So this is just a direct attack against the EPA's, like you're putting the Army Corps engineer permits over the EPA permits. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. The, I have I have, I have, have two more cases here. And then, oh, really? Okay. No, I have two more. One of them is about antitrust. Um, so with antitrust... Uh, there's something called the essential facilities doctrine and the essential facilities doctrine helps rein in who had the potential to help rein in large tech companies because it prevents companies from abusing their monopoly over a service or product that a different competitor needs. Um, that's a super important aspect, um, but they totally eviscerated that doctrine and the court was taking away the main legal doctrine for taking so-called bottleneck monopolies that you want to be able if if a company is a monopoly over has a monopoly over one input in a very big system process and they're able to exploit their market power to hold on to that um, input and keep it from getting into other hands that might actually compete with different companies within that larger corporation um, you're causing a bottleneck in the overall general economy that should be avoided um, but okay. you're artificially creating it to boost your profit margin. I see. And the court is giving them the right to do that. <laughs> and uh, by this point, I just want to give some updates on how class actions uh, have 
fallen. So class action settlements fell from 2.7 billion to 1.3 billion just from 2017 to 2018. Yeah. It's just one year and it's a whole billion dollar and a half less. And it was from one of these, it was from the Lewis v. Epic Systems case. Yes, that's the one that did it. Yeah. That's the one that did it. And now by 2018, 54% of workers are affected by mandatory arbitration. In 1992, it was 2%. Yeah. And and of course, the the natural conclusion to draw is that all of these companies are going to include mandatory arbitration. Why wouldn't they? They'd be stupid to not. And so 81 out of the top 100 fortune companies have mandatory arbitration clauses in their sales contracts 78 of 100 have class action waivers in their sales what a nightmare guys this is such a nightmare we all of us watching need to get elected so we can try to over undo as much as we can of this because this is crazy it really like like to see how little power you now have as a citizen and this is again this is supposed to be the whole foundational idea of democracy right is that you can band together and make your voice heard because of the strength in your numbers and they're just wiping that out totally wiping it out now it's all about the size of your wallet right yeah. and that's the world that they want to live in and we need to get out there and fight for a different world and different vision because this is nuts this is nuts i don't care if you're republican or democrat this is nuts yeah this is i do not believe that a Republican from Wisconsin who voted, who 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 is voting for Donald Trump because he didn't like the way NAFTA was negotiated. I do not believe that that guy thinks that class action lawsuits should be should be able to be completely avoided by corporations. I don't believe that to be the case. I mm. do not think. I think there is a massive majority of American citizens that would love to see changes to this type of stuff. They just don't know about it. Exactly. Yeah. So hopefully they're listening. Hopefully, yeah, eventually, because we will be listened to by every American (laughs) at some point. Yeah. Okay, that ends book club, guys. Now, we're going into our deep dive. What did we cover this week on the deep dive, Ben? We looked into the global food system. So this sprouted out of a Guardian article that I sent to Anthony a few days after our last recording session. Um, And it was by this guy, George Monbiot. Um, names are so difficult yeah i don't know how to say his name to be honest uh but he he is something of a global food systems expert a lot of my information has come from what he's written okay uh but he was specifically citing a scientific paper that recently came out that said that the the risks that climate change is posing to the global food system has been far underestimated um The paper talked about the meanders in the jet stream, which is the band of strong winds a few miles above the Earth's surface at Mm -hmm. mid-latitudes, and how if it moved a little bit north or south, it changes the weather patterns in significant crop-growing regions. Uh, And his point was that climate change is going to make these meanders happen more often and more significantly is going to change um, change these weather patterns and it's going to potentially change them in multiple growing regions at the same time. Mm. So what this paper found is that if even a small decrease in yields in crop yields comes from multiple of the major growing locations at, at once, it poses systemic risk. And so Mom, George Mombayo, he talks a lot about the food system as a complex system. What this means is, I mean, everything we, everything is a complex system. Society is a complex system. Um, the economy as a whole is a complex system. The ecosystem is a complex system. When complex systems become really consolidated, meaning they have like these big nodes, um, these really important choke points almost. And those those nodes of the system have really strong connections, more connections between other really big nodes. It's basically that it's less diversified. It's much more susceptible to shocks. Right. And so what this paper and what this guy's point is, is that, 
with more of these shocks that are going to come from climate change and come from many other things that we'll talk about, mm -hmm. the global food system is in a really precarious state. Um, and so I thought it would just be interesting to get into that a little bit more deeply. I don't think we think about our food. We don't, we're in the West, right? We do yeah. not think about our food very often. No. We think about, we, we, we order Uber Eats. We go to supermarkets that are always stocked to the brim. We don't even think about food as a concept of scarcity. We don't even think about it. It doesn't even enter our mind, right? No. Um, but thinking about food as a global system and how food gets to where you are is actually really interesting. And it's, I think, one of the most advanced and complex things humans have ever developed yeah. is how we're able to get food from all over the world right to your doorstep. Yeah. And I mean, the the movement of the food is one thing, but the growing of it is a whole other, right? Because we've we've kind of maxed out our growing systems mm -hmm. so much, which is which is part of the problem, right. right? Because we in our in our pursuit of efficiency, we have given up diversity. Mm -hmm. But it's also it also means because of technology like fertilizers, right? We grow two, three, four times more food than we would ever be able to grow without it. Right. And well, so I want to talk, I don't want to start here, but maybe mm. we should. We can start with how much food we waste. Okay, sure. Yeah. So in the United States alone, 40% of the food that we produce is wasted. Yeah. Um, that is estimated to be $218 billion or 1.3% of the United States GDP wasted every year yeah. and fills up our landfills 24% solid waste. Um, that is, it, it's a crime. It's a sin. It's, it's a just, mind blowing amount. It's a mind blowing amount that 40% of our food is wasted. And this happens at multiple points in the chain. Right. Right. So like, it doesn't just happen at the consumer end. It doesn't just happen there. It happens all the way throughout the process yeah. of transportation, of picking all the way through. Yeah. I mean, I think a really easy example to think about is orange trees in Georgia or Florida, right? All of these oranges that hit the ground and become bruised after falling off the trees, they're they're thrown out. Because usually, even though they're completely good to eat, I mean, oranges have peels on them, it's not economically viable for these companies. Well, first of all, they, they can't sell them to stores. They don't want them. In America, they don't want them. And it's not economically viable for them to try to ship them overseas they're not getting incentivized well enough to feed the hungry with there's them. no reason for that yeah so they just chuck them mm -hmm. yeah there's so the, the paper that i read talking about food waste put in a really interesting frame where they said there's actually a massive economic opportunity in the realm of food waste mm. and they say there's 155 to 400 billion dollar economic opportunity they argue that investing $14 billion in cost-effective solutions per year over the next 10 years could reduce food waste by 45 million tons for each of those years. Wow. Um, it would result in a $73 billion in annual net financial benefit to the United States and re reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 75 million metric tons, um, save a shit ton of water, and recover the equivalent of 4 billion meals for people in need over 10 years. Wow. Um, so... I think it's nice to see that there's solutions getting put out there. Mm. But when I read through them, they were pretty lame. Really? They weren't, they looked to me like they were written by like a consultant. And not that poop on consultants, because I am one. But it was just, it was too high level. It didn't have the nitty gritty mm. that I thought it really needed to be a solid plan. Okay. Maybe that's happening internally and I just can't see that part. Hmm. And they only publish the high level stuff for public consumption. Yeah. That's possible. Um, but it is good to know that people are thinking about this in the realm of economic opportunity and they are finding it to fit in our current market system. True. I would expect that someone in agriculture would kind of have to be the one to take the first leap. Yeah. Right. And maybe probably like it would probably have to be one of these massive conglomerates that owns a ton of the supply chain already right well i think they're arguing for a third they're arguing for a new node in mm. the process they're arguing for a new node 
the food stability, the food sustainability node. Yeah. And I, I like that idea. It's just about the amount of upfront capital right. that it would take. Right. So they argue $14 billion per year. That's a lot of money. Yes. Yeah. That's a startup can't really raise that. No. And that's why it feels like you like it. That should be like a U.S. department. Yeah. That should be like a U.S. department that is going to be taking care of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, there's other arguments too with in regards to food waste that like food production isn't our issue. It's just how we distribute the food. Mm-hmm. And right now we're only distributing the food based off who has the money to pay for the food. Mm-hmm. And that's causing a lot of problems because very poor areas of the world don't have the money to buy this food. Mm-hmm. And it's not economical to ship the food to them based off the profit profit motive definition of economical, right? I think there is an economical incentive to keep people alive, Mm. but there isn't a direct short-term profit incentive to do so. Exactly. Not for the companies in this economy. Right. Right? And it's interesting because there there is certainly enough food produced every year to feed everyone in the world. Of course. It's something like like 3,000 calories are produced. But here's the thing. Like, part of it is because the food goes to the people with money. But part of it is because about half of the calories we produce right now feed livestock. Oh, of course. Yeah. And that's a huge part of this issue. Um, and I guess I can get into this now. Is Please, that's awesome. As, as people get richer, they want more diverse diets. They want more um, expensive types of foods. Meat, beef, is really where you go for that a lot of the time, right? So because the the cheap foods are, are the corn, the wheat, the rice, right? They're the ones that just come out of the ground. Mm-hmm. But feeding and raising a cow or a pig, that's a lot more expensive. It takes a lot more land. But the thing is, the world has been getting richer. China is the perfect example, China, right? China beef consumption has gone through the roof yeah. in the last 20 years. I mean, I mean, China since the 70s has brought 750 million people out of poverty. Right. So these people are, are eating more meat, which means that we have to grow more food to feed these animals, and take up more land with the livestock. Um, and... Again, it means that the food is being consolidated more towards feeding the rich with these very diverse diets. Mm -hmm. Um, The problem is this isn't changing anytime soon. Like more and more of the world, yes, like more and more of the global south is going to be coming into a place to diversify their diets. What about synthetic meat? Lab-grown meat? It's possible. There, there are possible solutions. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That oh, but can, you're saying, but that as far the, as the, the diet, yeah, changing, yes, in that the, direction. Yes, I totally agree. The people in poverty who are going to be coming out of it um, will definitely be looking for more expansive diets. No doubt about it. And yeah. They're going to be wanting importing beef, whether exactly. it's synthetic or not. They're going to be wanting to import beef. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't really do any research on the livestock aspect of that because so much of it's going to that. Yeah, I mean, half, half, half of all food grown. All right, guys. So you might know the camera quality go down at this point. <laughs> uh, the battery died. Yeah, it's an unfortunate reality. But So maybe that means we have to make the show shorter or get another battery for the camera. Yeah. Probably that. I, yeah. I, I don't think I can shut up. <laughs> it's going to be hard to limit ourselves. I know. Yeah. We are close, though. We are close. Ish. We're close-ish. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Yeah, we'll see. All right. So I want to talk about, we're talking about global food supply. I want to talk about the Global Food Security Index mm. that was released for 2022. Okay. Um, it goes around four key pillars to focus on. It focuses on affordability, availability, quality and, uh, quality and safety, and sustainability and adaptation. These are the four pillars that the index is based around. Mm. And what they're noticing is a downward trend in food security over the last four years mm. to not just from COVID. From, no. it, also, it also took place in 2019 as well. Mm-hmm. So the best countries in the world are Finland, Iceland, Norway, shocker. Mm. The worst countries in the world are Syria, Haiti, Yemen. America is sitting at 13th right okay. now. Yeah, we're sitting at 13th, hmm. um, which is the worst place to be, but we're the United States. We should be better. Yeah. Between 2019 and 2022, the index's affordability score, which I think is the most important here, mm. has fallen by 4% from 71.9 to 69, as shocks like COVID-19 pandemic, high input costs, and the war in Ukraine, as we will talk about in depth 
on how the war in Ukraine is affecting this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the worst place in the world for the Global Food Security Index score is Sub-Saharan Africa. Best in the world is North America. Europe is sitting very happily right below, right below North America, but the European countries that are doing so well, Finland, Iceland, just, just top the list and drag the average up a lot. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting here is we have plateaued since 2019 in global food, in global food security. It started, the index began in 2012, and we started at around 36. Right now, we're hovering at around 71. And that's just, no, we're hovering right now at 62. And we haven't seen any growth in the last four years. Hmm. Um, and what is causing that? A lot of what's causing that is the high costs of input prices, mm -hmm. um, the shock effects of climate change affecting yields. Mm -hmm. And I think we should talk about what we have about climate change affecting global food security. Okay. So the what climate change does is it means that big weather events, big destructive weather events are going to be much more common. Mm -hmm. Big destructive weather events destroy crops and they lower crop yields. So what this means is our food supply is going to it's going to dwindle, but it's also going to become much more uncertain. Right. And the uncertainty is very, very dangerous. Yes. It's the volatility because the growing season happens on a very set schedule, right? And if um, if, if you miss a time to put your fertilizer down, if your soil ends up getting torn up by a tornado or a hurricane, or you miss a time to harvest because your crops have been destroyed, Right, you can't get those back. And the thing is, you can't, unlike, say, a financial crisis, where you can use future money to bail out banks that have failed, you can't get future food. Right. You can't get future soil that gets torn up by a tornado. Exactly. Um, what, I, what I was reading here is climate-induced food shocks used to happen once every 12 years, but right now it's happening once every two and a half. So they're becoming more frequent. Yeah. They're becoming harder to predict. More extreme. They're more extreme. Re making our system resilient to this is going to be priority number one. Yeah. And that's why the thing that this index recommends the most is research and development specifically about those areas. Sure. And also to limit the amount of manual input that is necessary in growing food. Yeah. So I, I found one, one solution about... Uh, supporting development and uptake of perennial grain crops. What does that mean? So grain usually needs to be replanted every year. Oh. And just recently in China, actually, they were able to crossbreed a rice plant that doesn't need to be replanted um, every year, but instead every five or six years. Mm. And so this is huge because it's going to reduce soil turnover and soil erosion. And it's going to mean that these... It, these are deeply more deeply rooted plants that can resist climb like intense weather events. That's better. amazing. That's yeah. amazing. That's incredible. So that's that's absolutely incredible. Options. And so I, I don't know where you were going to go next here, but climate. We're talking about climate change as one of the areas for shocks. The other big one that I have is geopolitics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the next one I have is conflicts on my list. But before I go there, I want to just okay. bring one last final point about. One of the awful situations about all of this is not there isn't just an inequality in food um, distribution across the world. There's an inequality financially to the people who produce the food. So farmers um, on Earth produce 95% of the food, but they comprise 65% of the world's poorest people. So there's a massive disparity between the people who feed us hmm. and the lives that they are able to live based off of their amazing service. Huh. And that's what's, I think that's a true travesty. And I think like in the United States, I think farmers are having a more difficult time, especially the independent farmer year after year. Yeah. And the government tries to bail them out with the farm bill every year, which we'll be talking about in the end of August. Um, that, that'll be written in September. And how we deal with that is going to be very important because if you want to talk about adding a bunch of nodes, 
you get that by having individual family farms. Yeah. If you consolidate all the things onto big agriculture, you're making one big gigantic node, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You're not diversifying at all. Yeah. That's one of the problems that I absolutely... So I'm. we're very soon going to get into how consolidated this global food supply is. Okay. But yeah, in, in the United States, for example, like there, there are just a few companies that are buying up every one of these individual farms because... The farmer will not be able to support himself, and then the company will come in and they'll be like, "Hey, you can keep doing your thing, but we're just going to own your farm." Yeah. So like they can back him with their money, but they can also underpay him. Right. right. And so a lot of farmers, even if they do work for these big companies, they'll they'll need to have side jobs because they're underpaid by those. And companies. And that's what's happening right now. That's why sixty five percent of the world's poorest people are farmers, even though they produce the most important thing to everyone's life. Yeah. You know. So let's move on to geopolitics. I, I, I have how conflicts is deepening the energy, uh, the, the food crisis, mm -hmm. um, and specifically the war in Ukraine, obviously. Yeah. You might have heard about it. Um, it has supercharged a three-dimensional crisis about food, energy, and finance, but the food is what we're going to be focusing on mm -hmm. today. So I noticed, first of all, the index is noting that the world is actually falling into a more conflict-heavy and more confident, frequent cycle in our story as humans here. Yes. We are been on the downturn since 2012, and we have become more violent, um, which is unfortunate. Mm. But how is the war in Ukraine specifically affecting stuff? Well, Ukraine exports a lot of wheat on the world. Yeah. They're the fifth largest wheat exporter. And mm -hmm. I think like almost the top sunflower oil exporter. They are. They are, right? So where does the Ukrainian grain go? Ukrainian grain goes to Egypt. It goes to Turkey. It goes to Indonesia. Yeah. What else you got? I have Lebanon. So I have Egypt gets 85% of its wheat exports from nice. Ukraine. Lebanon, 81%. Tunisia, 50%. These wow. North African and Middle Eastern countries, super dependent mm -hmm. on Ukraine. And these are developing nations that cannot handle shocks in their food supply. No, they absolutely cannot sustain themselves. No. Um, they need to import most of their food. Right. Um, and so what's happened now, so there were already issues, obviously, because Ukraine is busy fighting a war in trying to get its grain out. But there had been an agreement. Mm -hmm. That was struck in July of last year. So this agreement was brokered by Turkey between Putin and Russia and the UN to mm -hmm. say that the Ukraine should be able to export its wheat so that these needy countries wouldn't starve. Uh, Putin agreed to it. So basically what happened is the Ukrainians would get their wheat to one of the ports in the Black Sea and Turkey and uh, those merchant vessels then be guided through mine-free waters um, into one of the Turkish ports who would then distribute the food into the Middle East. Yes. Now, Russia argues that the food wasn't going to poor countries. They're lying. Yes. They're just lying. That's fine. But they're lying, and you should know that. Mm -hmm. As a part of this deal, Russia also got exemptions to some European and Western sanctions mm -hmm. to sell their fertilizer abroad. Which is good for everybody. Yeah. We, we The West needed an excuse to buy Russian fertilizer because we need fertilizer, as we'll talk about. Um, and Russia wants to sell more of their stuff abroad. So that was a that was a part of the bargain. Yeah. But Ru but Russia is also claiming that the agreement that they had to lift some of those sanctions wasn't completely honored by mm -hmm. the West, which is why a week ago, Russia backed out of the grain deal. And so this is really this is one of those big shocks on the global food system because now it seems like this ukrainian grain no like this ukrainian grain won't be able to be exported this season so egypt where 85 percent of their wheat comes from ukraine is in a terrible dangerous position right mm -hmm. now um but this is this is just one of of many examples that could come from from conflict and geopolitics, right? Right. But I want to stick on Russia one more time because yeah. as of today, they currently bombed uh, a port on the back door of the Danube River. And this port held grain ships full of grain. Mm. Um, Russia has been bombarding Ukrainian Black Sea ports since it officially withdrew a week ago from the Black Sea. Um, and 
now this is limiting this is this is just i this is like a war crime you're limiting food supply to the whole world yeah you're threatening the global food supply by doing something like this they're purposely trying to reduce any income to ukraine as much as they can Mm -hmm. and to get rid of ukraine's um position in the world so no one wants to defend it they're trying to isolate it and their ability to feed their own population sure they're trying to kill as many ukrainians as possible right um which is very war crime Mm -hmm. like so this is one avenue like this is kind of an obvious one right ukraine can't get its food out also we have all these sanctions on russia so even though we want its fertilizer in the system we're also going to the west is going to get less of its food so it's it's like these since the relationship since the bonds in the complex system can't web out to as many countries now mm-hmm. they're becoming more consolidated and the system's becoming less resilient in right. that way exactly um do you want to go fertilizer next or do you want me to talk about why this system is like no really- let's do fertilizer now okay so what's going on with fertilizer so there were as we talked about there were specific exemptions in the sanctions regime put on russia and belarus to continue exporting their fertilizer um, but they have currently fallen and due to the war. And this is causing a massive shock globally. And so shortages have been compounded by export controls by China as well, which also produces a lot of fertilizer. Yep. And the Chinese uh, account for 30% of global phosphate fertilizer supplies. Um, as a consequence of the measure, the protection... Uh, to to protect it and they're doing this to protect their internal domestic market and Mm -hmm. so china's export shrunk by 50 percent in 2022 in the fertilizer industry and we were talking about chinese exports last week and maybe some of chinese exports declines is on purpose you think so well this uh, that's what this is as far as food as far as food sure yeah sure yeah as far as food yeah they're doing that on purpose i can see that so now what is china china is it uh is exporting much much less Mm -hmm. so we are talking about a massive decline which peaked in around june of 2021 and we're now down to about a fifth of what it was, maybe even less than a fifth of its peak in June of 2021. Wow. That's, that's how much, that's how less we're getting. So who is, who is, who is getting this Chinese fertilizer? Domestic Chinese uh, prices are currently around the same because they've been able to hold in their, their supply and their inventory, right? Well, Brazil has currently seen a $1,000 ton quoted for their fertilizer. And Brazil is the top ex- is one of the top exporters of Chinese fertilizer. Other Chinese, ex- uh, Chinese uh, partners in this are India um, and Pakistan. India is a massive country with a massive agricultural community mm-hmm. um, and also a geopolitical enemy of China. Mm. So China's cutting out of India. Yeah, it, takes away a quarter of its total fertilizer exports but it's also kneecapping a geopolitical adversary and they're using this as a as a as a weapon yeah um which is the opposite of what you're supposed to do we've seen fertilizer price because of the russia thing and the chinese thing we've seen we've seen fertilizer prices triple more than that quadruple yeah well in addition because in addition to to china russia is a huge exporter of of potash and phosphorus as well as belarus yep. who is not exporting anymore in its alignment with russia um so the these these global prices are just skyrocketing now the united states is responding which i'm happy to see uh joe biden has uh put uh, put aside 500 million dollars in programs to increase domestic fertilizer production Um, under the Fertilizer Production Expansion Program. Mm. And some aspects of this I want to read out. So what can funds be used for? Funds can be used to build new facilities and buying or buying an existing facility or purchasing land, covering pre-development costs like engineering and other professional fees, um, providing working capital to expand capacity or increase outputs and other things like that. One aspect I liked about it was it had a Made in America guarantee. Um, Mm. all All FP... 
all fertilizer production expansion program products must be produced by companies located in the U.S. or, or its territories, create good paying jobs at home, and reduce the reliance on potentially unstable or inconsistent foreign suppliers. So this is another aspect of the United States decoupling. Yeah. Right. That's what this is. Onshoring. Onshoring. The end of globalization. Deglobalization. Yeah. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in everything. And it's and in in the food system, it's the most dangerous thing. The worst thing you could do. Yeah. And so now I think I can get into my my spiel a little bit. So so we're talking about how the food system is a complex system. We've got these nodes, you've got these connections. And I've been talking, I've been making hints about how this is getting less resilient. How much less resilient is it? Well, when these systems are get more connect, like they get stronger connections between the nodes and the nodes get bigger, they get more important, then it's more susceptible to collapse. Mm-hmm. And so what happens when these systems collapse is they tip into a different state of a, a different steady state and you can't real like it takes an enormous amount of energy to revert back to that steady state um as the food system like each of these shocks is kind of going to tip us further into a new normal of the food system and you can already see like it seems like we're tipping towards something that is much less globalized and so i'll start this by saying how much we need a globalized food system yep 25 percent of the world could be fed by food grown within 100 kilometers of them. That's three quarters who couldn't be fed. That's crazy. Our population is completely dependent on this. Okay, and so this is how precarious things have now become. First of all, our global diet, okay? It's become extremely homogenous. Four crops make up 60% of what we eat. God. Wheat, rice, corn, and soybeans. What a nightmare. Trade to these these bonds between these nodes has increased massively. Between 1961 and 1970, global trade in agricultural products increased by $18.6 billion. That seems like a lot, right? From 2009 to 2018, it rose by $488 billion. Okay? It's a crazy amount of acceleration. And again, this is partly because of the diet structure of developing countries changing. You need more different types of foods from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So you're saying this is being driven by people coming out of poverty, wanting more expansive diets. Yeah. 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 In in large part, not entirely, but in large part. What about producers of these foods as far as countries? Okay. Four countries harvest 76% of the world's corn. Okay. USA, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, the PRAC. Ukraine was one of them, but I was looking at 2022 data. They were not one of them in 2022. Wow, that's crazy. Five countries sell 77% of the rice. Five countries supply 65% of the wheat. Number one being Russia. Number five being Ukraine. Three countries supply 86% of the soybeans. All of this is being more consolidated. Nations are polarizing into super importers and super exporters. Mm. Five countries, China, Korea, it's a group in the Koreas, Japan, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are responsible for about 40% of food net imports. Seven countries, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, New Zealand, Thailand, and the USA account for about 55% of total net food exports. Wow. Wow. That's insane. Since 1900, okay, okay. So this is this is where the food's coming from and where it's going. Okay. What about how the food is grown? Well, since 1900, the world's crops have lost 75 percent of their genetic diversity, which means they're way more susceptible to pandemics going through plants or or viruses. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so basically, this this push for efficiency is coming at the cost of resilience. And the one other thing I'll, I'll get into here is is what about the actual companies right how much are they doing how consolidated are they oh god four companies cargill archer daniels midland bunge and louis dreyfus control on one estimate 90 percent of the global grain trade um four more companies control 66 percent of the agricultural chemical markets and four more control 53 percent of the global seed market 
This is insanely consolidated. Oftentimes, this this guy that I read will compare it to the global financial system before 2008, except this is worse. This yeah. is more consolidated than that was. Wow. Um, and this so, is crazy. And this is why I want to interrupt because I just please. want to I want to really push on. This is why we need antitrust legislation and people in the FTC who are really going to take this stuff seriously. And I just want to say, like, you're, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, Republican. When you hear that, you should get really scared. Yeah. Because this is way above politics. This is a bad economic model. Yeah. This is a bad economic model. Exactly. This is way above politics, man. Yes. To have an economic model that is rewarding the the biggest companies by making them bigger and bigger constantly is not good for society or the world. No, you are destroying food diversity. Yeah. And you are destroying our ability to have a, resi- a resilient food network. Exactly. This is this is extremely dangerous. Like uh, uh, people in the poorest countries are so endangered right now. It is food hunger was decreasing year after year by pure volume of people until 2015 because of these of this interconnectedness of the global food system that's losing its resilience and making it more susceptible more sensitive Mm -hmm. to these shocks so what's gonna so what's what happens when these shocks hit well we we've already seen the the effects of the ukraine war there are other instances in 2008 and 2011 11 where they were the biggest food price spikes right and the weird i think it was because there were there were lower harvests that year. yeah there was pretty um, bad droughts and or, or maybe it was bad droughts because i think in some places they produced even more wheat than uh than they got on a usual year and i think the global wheat production actually ended up being more than the average so what happened? Well, digging into this, I've realized, I found out that in the 90s, Goldman Sachs made an index to track commodities, yes. including food. Yes, there's a wheat index. Yeah, because they thought it was going to be, um, it, it's just an easy way to invest in something that's going to kind of constantly grow with a growing population, right? You need more food, so they're going to make more and more of it. And so people would invest in it, and eventually it got to the point where it was a bubble, and they were just speculating, and they saw the index as a place that they could park their money and watch it grow because it was this, it was called a long-only derivative. Yeah. People couldn't short it, so it was just going to keep growing and growing. So the thing that happened actually in 2008 and 2011 is people stopped investing. The bubble, a little air was let out of the bubble. And it wasn't actually a problem with global food production. It was just speculators being spooked. And so because of that, since there was less money going into the food market, some countries restricted their exports. Oh. And once countries restricted their exports, yes. the most vulnerable importer countries felt the hit that's incredible right and so this is a big part of a lot of people think this is a big part of what caused the arab spring and that was some of the yeah worst political unrest in the (laughs) middle east ever uh so we so i i want to talk about that relationship with free trade in regards to food yeah because this index tracked that and it found a very very significant positive correlation between countries that had good scores and their trade relationships in regards to how freely they were importing and exporting food products. Mm. And countries that were limiting or trying to become like autarkish, self-sufficient states had worse food outcomes than those that were open and importing and exporting and taking advantage of comparative advantage that you need to in the modern world. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. Like globalization has been remarkably economically beneficial. Definitely. For everyone. Without a doubt. Yeah. And food is probably that food is so important because it's not only a market within itself, but it's also supporting your population so integrally. Right. Right. So it and something that we kind of touched on last week in our deep dive discussion is that people tend to be good for an economy. Right. 
and food means you can have more people. Yep. Um, so we're about to have a lot more people. Uh, yeah, yes, but uh, we also are risking seeing a lot of people dying. Mm. Uh, so we're we're just gonna have to see. I think one thing that's kind of good is that there's there's a tension on this because of Ukraine and Russia. I think that's a difference from what we had in 2008 and 2011 because it was something that was buried deep within the financial system. Mm-hmm. People weren't really worried about like even though there were some some lower harvests, people weren't weren't putting a lot of attention on, on getting enough food to these underprivileged areas. Now I think there is a little bit more attention on that, but we are still really systemically at risk. At risk. So like what's the solution to this? I have a few. Okay. So so technology can help. That's so, what I've heard the most. Yeah. That's what that that was my main thing. What do you have? I have like technological usage for pesticide control. I have like I have doing more genetic modification on food mm. to increase its diversity. Yes. Um yeah. And then increasing the amount of exports and imports that countries are doing and opening up your barriers for that. Yeah. Which that's are, really all I got. But that's not like it's not what I wanted to hear. No, it's not great. And unfortunately, that last one just probably isn't going to happen. Right. Because we're just going to go into a deglobalized world. Yeah. Okay. I have antitrust. Oh, nice. Of which course. you already mentioned. Yes. Um, just to build our resilience. Um, the So one, one thing is directing government funding towards research in new agricultural techniques we right now a lot of government funding kind of aligns with what the private sector is already doing Mm -hmm. which is again it tends to be you want to do towards efficiency away from diversity Mm -hmm. we need the government to do the opposite thing okay like an example is funding more research into soil and this is something that i didn't really get deep into but i just read mentions that we know very little about the massively complex system that just the soil that we grow our plants in Mm -hmm. is um right now we're spending way more money on like the mars rover program to figure out what the surface of that planet is like when we don't actually really understand the surface of our own planet it's so fascinating and we if we are able to learn more about it then we might be able to engineer Mm -hmm. healthier and more productive soil to grow more and we are running out of healthy soil which is scary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we need to figure out a way to create healthy soil. Over farming like this, it, it does that. That's what it does. Yeah. And the over-reliance on fertilizer too. Yes. Which is another thing. It's a really a double-edged sword because you need the fertilizer to get the efficient crops. Mm-hmm. But over-usage of fertilizer destroys your next set of soil, right? Yeah. So it's a hard... And the weird thing is because these farms, they, they use manure to make their fertilizer right and so you've already got a ton of animals there and they're pooping all the time Mm -hmm. and you're like oh well i have this easy way to reuse it but once you're using it too much like like it becomes less effective over time yeah you're you're hurting yourself but you just don't want to figure out another solution for where to put the poop yeah i was reading that some fertilizer prices were actually coming down a little bit Mm -hmm. and the reason was because people were using dung poop yeah. Which is not as effective, but they were using poop to avoid paying the high prices. Yeah. That makes sense. It's not good, though, for the efficiency of the crop, right? It's no. not good for that. Yeah. No, definitely not. Um, I I mentioned the perennial grain crops. The One other thing I have is precise fermentation, which I didn't really, I didn't, again, didn't look into enough, but they're working on genetically engineering. So genetic engineering thus far for, for agriculture is focused on plants. Mm-hmm. They're looking at how to do it with microbes, Ooh. which apparently can turn, um, can like change the nature of certain materials to make them more calorie dense wow. or nutrient dense. Um, it can create, I think I heard, listened to a podcast where someone was talking about how they were able to make a pancake in a lab out of, um, Oh, what is it? What is it? I forget what the base, what the basic was, but but rather than like using your actual eggs or the normal uh, ingredients to a pancake, they have these engineered microbes that can make something that tastes exactly like it, and that apparently can make other foods that might taste like the whole spectrum of what we know. Wow. Um. 
so that might be an option. That would be my dream come true. Yeah. Yeah. That would literally be my dream come true. So there are possibilities, um, but they would need to... Hope is not lost, but honestly, the whole point of this show is that we need public investment in research. We need public investment into specific aspects of our economy that are vital for the betterment of human life. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. And food is the most important out of all of them. Yeah. You can't get educated if you can't eat. Okay. Um, This is the most vital thing. Mm -hmm. And the public research, as I've read in this, has actually declined over the last few years. Public investment into research and development for agricultural stuff Mm. has gone down over the last few years. That trend needs to be reversed. Yeah. Immediately. I'm not even that surprised because, because in addition to this consolidation, the thing about fertilizers is uh, you've got decreasing yields like mm-hmm. even with advances like it it tends to be a logarithmic scale like first of all as about how much fertilizer you put on it but even with the scientific developments of fertilizer like the returns are just getting less and less and less yeah 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 like for yeah like a I understand. That sucks. I'm just trying so that the audience can understand. It just levels off. It like it plateaus. Like it'll have an exponential benefit and then it'll stop benefiting so much. Yes. Man, that sucks. But there are some solutions and we can hope they get acted. Yeah. Um, And this was a really interesting deep dive. Yeah. Because it's not something you think about very often. Not at all. Well, and that's like, that's the thing with, with us in America. Really, to be honest, you won't have to think about it. We no, make enough food to sustain ourselves yeah so i guess for for our audience it's much more likely to just be a curiosity but uh rather than like something to vote on and change potentially Mm -hmm. um this is one of my favorite deep dives i think really i think i learned a lot doing this This i learned a lot i i probably liked studying for it more than talking about it just because i feel like we weren't very put together yeah we didn't have like a structured um but i think next week guys we're gonna get away from the policy stuff and we're going to get a little ideological we're yeah. going to do the rise of neoliberalism and kind of talk about what neoliberalism is and then how it made the world that we currently exist in and mm. I, it's going to be a really interesting conversation and thanks so much guys for tuning in it was yeah. a blast i, I hope say. you enjoyed it thanks everyone bye bye